Everyone knows Goosebumps is probably one of the best analog horror shows ever, and it's also a kid's show, which makes it even better. And it might just be my nostalgia talking, but as a kid, I really did love Goosebumps. I got all the books from the library. I loved how creepy and scary it was <laughs> and it did get a tv show and it was barely on tv it was only on in the month of october which made me so upset because i loved watching the show and if you were lucky my school had a few vhs's of goosebumps we got to watch it in class sometimes it also had the greatest intro song to any tv show ever it also adapted 43 from the 62 books into the series, which is really cool. But after four years and four seasons and 74 episodes and millions of children that have nightmares from one creepy doll, yes. I would say the Goosebumps TV show had a decent run. 10 years later, after Goosebumps had already ended, a little show popped up on Discovery Kids, R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour. Well, three years earlier to that, there was a, a movie called The Haunting Hour that starred Emily Osment and Tobin Bell, the Tobin Bell from the Saw movies, Tobin Bell of Saw fame, you know, Jigsaw, him, yes. He was in this movie. But we're not going to talk about that right now. If you want to see me talk about that, let me know in the comments below. R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour is another child horror anthology series. And it's honestly way creepier than Goosebumps. Like, they turned the notch up just a little bit for this show. There are better jump scares and more compelling stories. And some of the characters are just downright creepy as hell. <laughs> What are you doing in my walls? And although I had never watched it on TV, everything you hear about it and all the reviews are very positive. It, it has a really positive look on the community. But the weird thing is, I had never heard about this show. I had a TV. I haven't been in the Stone Age. I haven't been sitting under a rock. I loved Goosebumps. I still watch Goosebumps to this day. It's on Netflix. I, I, I pop a few episodes on. While I was searching for something to talk about this Halloween, I stumbled across the show and I was like, what is this? And I decided to check out a few episodes and I have come to the conclusion that I do like it a lot. Probably a little bit more than Goosebumps, honestly. Hearing it was on Discovery Kids, I figured it'd be a little low budget show, but no, the show looks really nice and has some really good cuts and shots and it's, it's just, it's a really well shot show. It still looks good even today. And it had some pretty big stars like Bailey Madison, Debbie Ryan, Greg Sulkin of Avalon High fame. Go check out that video right there. And Tom Kenny. SpongeBob, the guy who voices SpongeBob, yeah, he's in this show. So I have no clue how this show slipped by me. I was gonna make a video talking about the series as a whole, but really, I just wanna talk about the first two episodes and one episode in season two. They're all connected and they're very fucking creepy. And they're just way too crazy to not talk about them. And these three episodes actually involve another doll that's creepier than Slappy himself. <laughs> We start the episode out by seeing a workshop for dolls. This is where we get to meet Lily D, the creepy doll we're gonna be following for the next three episodes. And in this scene, the doll maker finishes her face and then deems her not good. She's not good. And marks her for destruction. And that's where that scene ends. And then we get to meet the family of this episode. We get to meet the main character, Lily. She's a spoiled little girl that's getting a really you doll, which is basically an American girl doll, but life-size and hella creepy, very uncanny valley. People send in pictures of their daughter and then these people make the doll look like their daughter and then send them a life-size version of themselves pretty much. And while Lily is waiting on her doll to get there, we get to meet the rest of the family, such as her mom, Jill, her dad, Henry, and her brother, Brandon. And in this first scene, you can tell that there's tension between the family or at least between Lily and her mom and her brother. Okay, mom, order. Lily, we can't afford anything else. But her dad is the one that spoils her and buys her anything she wants, so obviously she loves him and kisses up to him as much as he can. And while she gets everything she wants, her brother has to do all the chores around the house, he has to make sure his sister is safe, he has to do all this stuff, and he gets kind of neglected and forgotten about. Same thing with the mom, she has to work around Lily's needs and just deal with her horrible child because she just can't seem to say no to her husband. Or Lily. Finally, the company shows up in a weird pink car and brings her Lily D, the doll. I guess the D stands for doll? Lily doll? I don't know. And not only is this doll absolutely terrifying, so are the people that bring her the doll. Most of our lucky girl. And they are very predatory towards parents that can't say no to their kids, because when they bring her the doll, they offer to bring Lily and Lily D to a salon and give them both a haircut and makeover for a, a low, low price of 250 extra bucks. You got 250 laying around, you know? And they literally do this. They take Lily to get her haircut, and this woman literally pampers the doll as well right beside her. It's so weird and creepy. And even the mom is a little creeped out by this. They get back home, Brandon and his best friend, they both agree that Lily D is absolutely terrifying and needs to be destroyed. You need dynamite for that thing. 
But their conversation gets interrupted by Lily, who's gonna have a doll party with some little girls from around the neighborhood. And at this party, Lily is bragging about how she has this new expensive really you doll and everything she gets, she gets two of so her and the doll can have it. Even like furniture, she has two beds in her bedroom. And the little girls do speak up about this and they're like, that's a little weird that you buy clothes for your doll. I mean, they're just toys, you know? And to add fire to this flame, one little girl says that Lily D told her doll that Lily D doesn't like Lily. And hearing that her doll doesn't like her, this sends Lily into a rage and she rips this girl's doll apart. And when her mom confronts her about this, she is just rude and she's like, I don't care if I don't have any friends, I have Lily D, which is a literal doll. You can't have a doll friend for the rest of your life. I mean, I guess you could, but you'll be fucking weird. So to punish her, Jill decides that maybe she should spend some time without Lily D and takes Lily away and won't give her back until Lily is a good girl again. And almost instantly, she starts acting kind of weird toward this doll, like treating this doll like her actual daughter. She likes how the doll is quiet and well behaved, unlike her daughter. She starts shopping for clothes online with it and the doll never leaves her side. Very weird shit. And Brandon seems to be the only one that has a grip on reality. Lily D is here as my guest, not Lily's. We need counseling. And this is when the dad's like, why don't we go ahead and just give the doll back to Lily? And this is when Jill gets her, her big girl britches and says, No. Final answer. Because she likes the doll more than her own daughter, that's why. While they're in the kitchen arguing, Lily spills some gravy on her mom's laptop. Or did she? See, because Lily claims that Lily D did it, but Lily D is a doll. So Lily gets in trouble and gets sent to her room, and later that night, Brandon goes to check up on her. He asks her to just tell mom the truth, but she stands with her story and says that Lily D did it, she saw her do it, and she won't get in trouble for something she didn't even do. Also, Brandon's just a great brother throughout this whole series. No matter what happens, how angry he makes her, he goes and checks up on her, he makes sure she's okay, he does things, he cooks for her, he's a good brother, I just want to point that out. And while they're having this conversation in Lily's room, their mom and dad are talking about the same Thing. And the dad finally admits that he just doesn't like seeing Lily sad and that's why he kind of spoils her. Jill is finally just tired of it and she thinks that Lily needs to be punished and this is the way to do it. And she says all of this while she's tucking in the doll in her bed. She's going to sleep with this doll in the bed. She's weird as hell. Brandon comes in and he tells his parents that he's worried about Lily, that they should really just throw the doll away because it's causing commotion in the family. But Jill refuses and says, no, we've spent too much money on it. We can't throw it away now. But I think it's because she's attached to the doll. And this kind of confirms my theory because she's starting to talk to the doll. I can't stand how weird this is. I, I, when I was watching this, I was cringing at how weird her mom is. But later that night, Lily's dad sneaks the doll back into her room so she can have it and be happy. And then we get this very terrifying scene. And then the next morning, the doll is back in bed with Jill and Henry. And the next morning, Jill makes breakfast for everybody, especially her favorite daughter. The doll. I'm talking about the doll, by the way, not her actual living daughter. Also, in this scene, Lily starts to complain that her neck is feeling stiff and she's feeling a little sick. And this is a little bit of foreshadowing, so keep that in the back of your mind for a little bit. After that, we cut back to after school. They're coming back home. Brandon and Lily are home alone, and Lily decides she's gonna go apologize for everything, and she can't find her mom. Her mom's at an appointment. So she decides to go and try to find her doll, but her doll can't be found. So Lily goes and asks Brandon, where is the doll? Has he seen the doll? And then this happens. You're supposed to leave it alone. There's a flamethrower! No, I'm just talking to my sister. No, that's me! That's yeah. me! Come on! Yeah. No, no, no. Ugh, I hate that. I hate when things in horror movies run by people because I hate the feeling that somebody is behind me or watching me and I don't see them. And when I used to play horror games on this channel, there were games that did that to me. And I didn't notice that things were happening until after when I was editing the video and it creeped me out even when I was doing that. God, I hate that shit. Needless to say, that creeped me the fuck out. <laughs> but Lily is starting to feel more and more sick throughout this episode. So she decides to go downstairs and find something to eat. And this is when she passes out on the kitchen counter. And when her mom comes home, she wakes her up and finds that she has paint on her hands. Jill asks Lily if she's been playing with the doll and Lily replies with How could I? You hit her. This confuses Jill and so she runs upstairs to find this. No! No, no, she did it! There you go again! You are in very, very serious trouble! No, it's not fair! She did it! Stop. And that's where the episode ends. And quickly things are starting to heat up in this story. It is like a slow burn, but towards the end of this episode, things kind of skyrocket. And already in this series, they're doing things better than Goosebumps with creating tension. There's a whole like two or three minute scene of Lily walking throughout her mom's room, looking for Lily D while Lily D is like hiding in the background. And she never finds her. And then the jump scare. 
But now let's move on to the second episode. We start with Lily crying in the bed. She claims she did not paint the wall. It must have been Lily D. She was passed out on the kitchen counter. Brandon wants her to just confess to painting the wall, confess to spilling the gravy, but she claims, I didn't do it. She's crying and she's like, I didn't do it. And he still doesn't believe her, but he wants to because he's a good brother. Brandon wants her to stop crying and he wants to help prove that Lily D can't move. So he sets up a not so secret camera in their mother's room. Like seriously, bro, you just set it on the dresser. And this is a great idea to prove that the doll doesn't move, but it kind of backfires. It looks like Lily D took the memory card out of the camera, so now Brandon doesn't even have proof that she didn't move because she took the thing out of the camera and he's very confused. Jill is understandably upset that her kids are spying on her and her doll and this is when she complains to the doll she's not even talking to a person she's talking to the doll and brandon finally snaps on her Can you believe what i have to put up with why are you talking to a doll and this is when lily's sickness gets the best of her and she passes out and her mom takes her to the hospital brandon invites his best friend over and they decide that they're going to go rip the doll apart and see what's inside they think that there's some kind of technology where somebody's controlling the doll and spying on their family and while they're doing this they find this secret message hidden on the back of her head when they see this they decide maybe they should go to the doll maker and ask her what is going on so they kind of put the doll back together and run off while they were tearing the doll apart lily and her mom are at the hospital she explains to the doctor that she hurts and just feels stiff all over and the doctor also talks about how she looks dehydrated and kind of plasticky but he says it's probably a virus she just needs to relax for a day or two and it'll probably be gone the boys make their way to the really you place with the salon and stuff and they find their way into the back room where the dolls are made and they get to meet the creator herself she's a very kooky weird old woman <laughs> No, 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 no. Who has been locked in this room full of dolls for a long time. And she seems to really hate this company. But granted, like I said, they, they make her work 24 seven. They also apparently destroyed her house. The, her husband is dead and can't help her anymore. So I, if I were her, I would go crazy too. Crazy. I was crazy once. They locked me in a room, a rubber room, a rubber room with dolls. And dolls make me crazy. Crazy? I was crazy once. They locked me in a room, a rubber room. I have a room with dolls. Dolls make me crazy. Crazy? I was crazy once. They locked me in a room. <laughs> what happened? Anyways, apparently the dolls had a bad soul. You see, every doll has a soul, and 99.9% .9 of them are good. They might be a little shy, they might be a little extroverted, but they're all good. But that 0-1% cannot accept their fate as a doll, and they want to be human. They would do anything to be human. She's basically Pinocchio but terrifying. The old lady tells the boys that that doll needed to be destroyed. She marked it to be destroyed for a reason, but the company just sold it anyway. So in a terrifying way, she shoes the boys out to go destroy the doll. Go. Destroy her. Go. Okay, I'm, I'm trying. But we cut back home and we see that Lily is now going to start seeing a therapist about her behavior. And because she's sick, her mom tells her to go upstairs and lay down and rest for a little bit. But before she goes upstairs, she apologizes for being the way she is and she promises to be a better girl. And her mom liked that. She then goes upstairs to see this. And this is the first time we, as an audience, have seen Lily D destroy something or do something bad. So she grounds Lily once again and she walks out of the room, but not before telling the doll. I wish you were my daughter. And this might be just a me thing, but I think Jill should also see a therapist for her being a little too attached to a doll. She's talking. She is talking to a doll. A doll. Do you think talking to dolls is weird, Zoro? I do too, Zoro. But in her mom telling her that she wishes she was her real daughter, this finalizes a curse that was put on Lily. Lily's legs become so stiff that she can't even walk anymore. And when she falls down, turns around, and it reveals that her legs are turning into plastic like a doll. She tries to crawl to her mom's room to get help, but she can't get there in time. And everything gets turned into a doll except for one eye. And this is when it's revealed that Lily D was turned into a real girl. Also, this single eye mixed in with like a whole plastic body is so uncanny valley and weird to me. I, I just couldn't really fathom. My brain was like, that's not real. I know that's not real, but that's real. That's actually there. She's a doll now. I don't know why. I think when I watched the show, my, my brain went back to like six years old and I just believed everything I saw on screen. <laughs> and you might be thinking, what is her mom doing during all this? Oh, she's taking a bath. You know, in the door, right across the, the way from her daughter, like being turned into a doll, she's just taking a bath. 
nice calm bath, you know. She doesn't hear any commotion outside. But Brandon makes it home from the workshop and he finds that Lily is not sick anymore and she's also doing the dishes and cleaning the house and folded the laundry. And her parents love that she's finally doing this, but Brandon finds it a little weird. And as a reward for doing the dishes and cleaning the house, the father offers to buy Lily D some clothes or buy the doll some new clothes or furniture. But Lily D's like, nah, I'm kind of done with dolls now. Dolls are for little girls. And then she throws her away. Brandon starts questioning Lily D about little things that Lily would know. And this is when Lily D quite literally threatens his life. You don't want me to be the bad Lily again, do you? Pretty sick if you ask me. And the next day, Jill starts noticing that Lily is acting a little strange. She was okay with her daughter being nice and cleaning the house for her the day before, but now she's asking, mother, do you love me a lot? Weirded out, she kind of shoes her away, tells her to go to school. Right outside, the boys are looking at the doll in the trash can. When they notice something they didn't see before. See, when they were tearing the doll apart, they never saw this dot on the back of her neck. Almost like it wasn't there before. And when they point this out to Jill, Jill says, How can that be? We gave them a photo of Lily's face and her measurements, but they didn't know anything about a birthmark. And so they decide to ask Lily a question about it, but she runs away. Not suspicious. This is when Brandon finally believes everything Lily has told him, and he just somehow knows that the girl running away is the doll, and that is the actual Lily. And he tells this to his mom, who actually just believes him for some reason. So the boys run off and they start chasing fake Lily while the mom is crying with the real Lily in her, sh in her shoulders, in her arms. <laughs> and this is when Jill finally tells Lily, I love you. And this breaks the curse. Lily gets turned back into a real girl and Lily D gets turned back into a doll. But she's still angry enough to where she sits up and she gets ready to kill all the And that's the end of Lily D. Or is it? Spoiler, no it's not because there's an episode in season two of the series called the return of Lily D. And it has nothing to do with the previous family. It's a new girl and her grandpa. And this one is a little bit creepier in my opinion, but you'll see why. The episode starts with a zoom out of Lily D's face. She's in pretty bad shape. She's covered in dirt and mud, found on the side of the road by two boys. And the boys find a doll on the road. So you know what they do? They decide to play with her, but they don't play with her the way you think they would. Yes, they do. They, they drag her on the back of a, a bike. They just drag her until her arm falls off. And while they're doing this, a little girl is walking on the sidewalk and sees this. She stops them and tells them that they're being mean to the doll. They're going to kill the doll. She's treating this doll like a real person. And reluctantly, the boys give the little girl the doll because they're not going to use it after this. They've already had their fun with it. So might as well get the give the doll to the little girl. This little girl's name is Natalie, and we'll be following her for the next 20 minutes. So she takes the doll home and sets it in the kitchen, but she doesn't warn her grandpa about it. Whoa. They come to find out that her name is Lily D because of a tag on her clothes. And the grandpa lets Natalie keep it, so she cleans her up. And while she's doing this, she's saying nice things to Lily, telling her that she's she's pretty, you know, all the girl stuff. After she's done cleaning Lily up, the grandpa tries to fix Lily's hand because the boys ripped it off earlier. But the bolt holding it has completely broken and he cannot fix it. So they have to send it to somebody to fix it. And we get to see a familiar face. <laughs> Yes, this is the doll maker from the last episode, and she is not happy to see Lily D. But she's noticed that something's a little different about her. Apparently, since Natalie was so kind to her, she has fixed Lily D's soul. So now Lily D is good and does not want to hurt humans anymore. She is content with being a doll. After fixing her, the doll maker hand delivers Lily back to Natalie, and they invite her in for some dinner. And this is when she explains to them kind of nonchalantly that Lily D was evil, but now she's good and she's fine. She seems to be at peace. She also leaves a weird request. If she misbehaves, call me. No, no, Natalie's a good girl. I meant the doll. We then cut to the next day where Natalie finds a baby pigeon hurt on the ground, but Lily doesn't appreciate new friends. That night, Lily gets out of bed and tries to climb a bookshelf to get to the bird that's at the top. And she is not very successful. Of course, this wakes up Natalie and her grandpa. Grandpa is confused at what happened and Natalie says she doesn't know, the, the thing just fell. Things don't fall down by themselves. How did the doll get on the floor? But he believes her anyways and they go back to bed. And then we cut back to the doll maker. She's back making more dolls like she does. And by the way, her name is literally the doll maker, like on the wiki. I looked it up because I wanted to try using her real name, but her name is the doll maker. So she's working on a new doll, but this is also when we learn that the other dolls can talk and only to her. They're also creepy children. Has it? Back to the bow. To the bow. Bad through and through. Through and through. 
I hate creepy children. They warn her that Natalie's in danger, that they should really destroy the doll. The doll can't ever be truly good. So she really needs to destroy the doll to save Natalie. Also, I don't really know if this is actually happening or if she's just insane and it's all going on in her head. But either way, this was pretty eerie and kind of creeped me out. So we cut to the next day, Natalie and her grandpa are helping the bird downstairs. And while they're helping this bird, the doll maker pulls up to try to get Lily D so she can destroy her. But Lily sees her pull up before they do. And she is mischievous to say the least. By that I mean she kills her. She just knocks her the fuck out with a fishbowl. She throws a fishbowl at this woman. And she's just creepy. I don't like this. I don't like her. She's just creepy. If you want to terrify me, leave a doll that looks like this at the edge of my bed staring at me. I will fucking just... I'll seize up and die. Obviously, they call the cops to come help her and get her to the hospital. The only evidence they have is this fishbowl that's outside that doesn't have fingerprints on it. So they want to know how the fishbowl ended up hitting her on the head. Was it on the windowsill? Did somebody throw it? Was it like a, a booby trap? But they have no answers and they would never just set up booby traps for random people. They're not paranoid. But this is when Natalie starts to think that maybe Lily D was the one that did it. Now, she's a little girl. She has a wild imagination. Of course, the doll didn't throw the fishbowl out the window. And then she also asks her grandma grandpa to throw Lily D away because now she's scared of her and when she goes to grab Lily D to throw her away Lily D is nowhere to be found but we do see her hiding in a closet in the hallway and later that night she decides to come out of her hiding spot to take the bird for a little swim he just needs a little swim oh this this doll is so fucking creepy dude I cannot stand it she grabs the bird and tries to drown it in the bathtub but luckily Natalie hears the running water and confused asks her grandpa if he's taking a bath late at night obviously he says no and then she opens the door to find her bird is about to be killed. Natalie tries to explain to her grandpa that Lily D tried to kill her bird and he doesn't believe her, but he does notice that his lift to get up and down the stairs is at the bottom and not at the top where he left it. Natalie blames Lily D because Lily D would use it because she can't walk up and down stairs. This is kind of a neat, nice little detail they added that I didn't really think about until later. She can't walk up and down the stairs. Her legs are stiff. So she uses the lift to go up and down the stairs. P big fucking brain big brain. Grandpa's still in, in denial and thinks Natalie maybe has started sleepwalking and that she's done all this. And he doesn't believe her up until this moment. where Lily D tries to literally kill the man. After this, Lily D runs away and hides again, but Natalie thinks she finds her in her grandpa's other wheelchair in the kitchen. <laughs> Psych. Looks like Lily outsmarted Natalie, but luckily Natalie came fucking strapped. After a short fight scene, Natalie knocks Lily's head off into a pot, and then there's a creepy ass song with all the other little kid dolls singing, and then she slams the pot on Lily's head, and that's how it ends. That's the end of Lily D. There was no more episodes, so I'm guessing that she finally died. Maybe the song killed her off. I don't I don't really know. But yeah, that was the story of Lily D, the world's creepiest fucking doll. Annabelle don't have shit on Lily D. But yeah, that was three episodes of R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour. Let me know if you want me to talk about more episodes. There's a lot of really good creepy ones. There's one called Mascot that creeped me out a lot and would be really cool to talk about. But let me know if you want to see it in the comments below. Like the video if you liked the video. Thank you for watching the video. I appreciate you all. And peace. Okay, I get it. You guys don't like it when I talk about The Haunting Hour. You guys only skyrocketed that video to my most viewed video and gave me 50 subs within eight hours. So I'm going to talk about it again because I have no self-respect. On a real note, thank you for the last video. You guys did something I have never had happen on my channel before, which is success actually so <laughs> in the last video i mentioned uh, another episode of the haunting hour called mascot and you guys really really wanted me to review mascot so that's what i'm going to be doing today although i don't find this episode as scary as lily d this one was the most memorable to me for some reason i think it's because of big yellow i think i just have a thing for big puppets like when i made that country bears video you can tell i was really having fun making that video <laughs> big puppet make me go ooh la la ooh yeah goo goo gaga -ga. I revert to a baby, I guess. Anyways, enough about me. Let's let's get into the video. So the episode starts at a basketball game where we get to meet our two main characters. And I just want you to guess what this guy's name is. Go ahead. Give it a guess. A bigger kid. A little, a little chunky. Very annoying. I, d I don't like him. His name is Willie. Who in their right mind names their kid Willie? Like a baby pops out and you're like, that's my Willie right there. Oh, that's not a, that's not a good one. <laughs> Wait a minute. Nobody would name their kid Willie unless they absolutely hated them, which I would believe because this kid is the most annoying and negative kid I've ever seen in my life. I thought high school was supposed to be the best time of our lives. I mean, can this place get any sadder? But we'll talk about that more later. Oh yeah, the other dude's Drake. 
by the way. I just thought you should know that. So apparently their school is very bad at sports. They lose absolutely everything. Even in this episode, the first thing we see them do is score on their own goal. So they don't get any points. That's how basketball works, by the way. Nothing can be worse in the school until... I don't know, I gotta lie, I, I love Big Yellow, and, and this, he's just so adorable, and this goofy dance he does, I love it, he's just cute, kind of like my cat, who keeps getting in the way. But yeah, isn't he adorable? So Willie seems to think that the reason that their school is so bad at sports is because they have such a lame mascot. First of all, buddy, I will not be taking the Big Yellow slander in the comments, or from you fucking Willie. Big Yellow is up there with Big Al in my books. If your name is has Big in it, I'm probably going to enjoy your company. But luckily for these boys, getting a mascot is pretty easy. All they need is 50 student signatures and a teacher sponsor, and then they have to go through an audition process to get a new mascot. And so that's exactly what they start working on immediately. And I guess Big Yellow has ears somewhere on this weird shaped body because he somehow overhears them over everybody in this basketball game. And he doesn't look too thrilled about it. And apparently the rest of school is on his side because he gets the signatures pretty fast and they even get a teacher sponsor pretty fast and it is the vice principal of the school of all people. And while the vice principal is signing the paper, he lets the boys know that they need to tell the previous mascot that he's getting canned. And that's when they ask, Yeah, who is the current mascot? That is, that is a good question. Apparently nobody knows who the mascot is, even the coach of the basketball team and other sports teams. I think they only have one coach in the school. So there's somebody showing up to every school event in a giant mascot costume and dancing and nobody knows who's inside of it. Yeah, it sounds pretty normal to me actually. After they ask the coach, he sends them to the team manager for the basketball team, which is a thing apparently. And he pretty much just tells them the same thing. He says that the last team manager assigned the mascot, so nobody knows who it is. The boys ask if there's any way they can get a hold of this old team manager. And this is when the new one drops some lore on us. Apparently immediately after this kid graduated, he went missing and has been missing ever since. And no one knows why. But other than that, he does have some useful information and he lets the boys know that Big Yellow has his own room in the basement behind a boarded ominous door with a yellow hue. Seems normal to me. So the guys write him a note letting him know that he might be getting replaced sometime soon and they calmly slide it under the door. And a scared willy tries to calm Big Yellow down, but if I were Big Yellow and I was stuck in the storage closet in this basement in this dirty fucking room, and I hear these two boys talking shit about me for like two minutes outside my door, I would be a little upset too, I'm not gonna lie. And the next day the boys do the auditions for the new mascot. And during the auditions they get a lot of weird people, including a chicken, a banana, a dude in a shirt that says mascot. <laughs> that one's kind of funny though, I kind of like that one. And a dude in a yellow morph suit? What would that mascot be? A man? The mans. Of course, none of these guys make the cut, and they were losing hope until... Um, I think I know who's gonna be winning this challenge. <laughs> I think I know. I think I know. And it's my boy Big Yellow because he gets another try. And he pulls out the finishing move, the classic Big Yellow Shuffle. Come on, everybody, do it with him. Yeah! Yo, what the fuck, Willie? Obviously, Big Yellow doesn't like the blatant disrespect to his face from Willie. And for some reason, the boys picked this wolf? Wolfie? That's a dumbass name, by the way. And they're gonna let Wolfie know that he won the mascot competition the next day. But Big Yellow has other plans. You see, if Wolfie is dead, then Big Yellow can be the mascot again. Easy win. So you see, yeah, Big Yellow stalks this poor child in a mascot costume uh, and um, kills him. Then leaves Willie a message. If I were Willie, I would not fuck with this thing anymore. If I, if I saw that, I would stop immediately. This dude's insane. Whoever's in this mascot costume, probably insane. <laughs> Willie takes the wolf head to school and shows Drake, and Drake seems to have common sense. Dude, we have to tell a teacher. There's always one person in these episodes that have like common sense. It was Brandon in the last video. It's Drake in this one. But for some reason, Willie wants to try to solve this on his own and offers Drake to help him, but Drake is smart and says no. Which Willie responds with another annoying remark. I'm out. One day you'll grow backbone, Drake. I don't know if you guys have noticed. I really don't like Willie. Straight slander. Willie slander on this channel. Tell me how much you hate Willie in the comments. He's probably the worst character in this whole series. I'm not even joking. I, I hated him. I could not stand this kid. <laughs> and he absolutely deserves what's coming for him. Willie decides it's a good idea to go confront Big Yellow and enters his room in the basement. And he finds that 
no one is there. But we do get a few clues from things that were mentioned before. Apparently Big Yellow had something to do with the last team manager that disappeared a few years ago. Willie finds his wallet as well. And when he checks ID, we finally get to actually see who is in the mascot costume. And it is Big Yellow. But right after this, Willie starts hearing footsteps down the hallway and like an idiot bumps into the radio and starts the music. And obviously Big Yellow hears this and he doesn't like entry. Oh, never mind. He's having a good time. Look at his little dance move. Bro really does need a wash though. He has like mold growing on him. It's kind of gross. Obviously Big Yellow isn't stupid and locks Willie in the room. Then he proceeds to fill the room with nitrous oxide. That's yellow or some, somehow. I don't know how. Maybe it's mustard gas. But sadly, Willie escapes and <laughs> sorry, I can, couldn't keep a straight face on that one. And even after almost dying to this guy, he decides to go after him again. And he does find Big Yellow chilling in the gym. Okay, I don't think it's a good time to be texting right now, man. You have like a, a man-eating monster like 100 feet away from you. You should really be paying attention. But it looks like whoever is wearing the suit decided to run and leave the suit right there in the bleachers. Just kidding, Big Yellow is the suit. But as Willie was texting Drake, Drake was watching a movie, not paying attention to him. And he didn't see his text until the next morning. And when he does see the text, Drake runs to the school to try to find Willie and he has no luck, but he does find Willie's shoe in the bleachers. And later that day, Drake goes to the final varsity basketball game to try to find Willie. When he's not there, he calls him. He's like, hey, I'm in normal seats. Let's come hang out. And he keeps calling him repeatedly to no avail. That's when Big Yellow comes out and does his little jig again. When we get probably the wildest scene I have ever seen. It's wild, right? I'm kind of sad that this episode didn't get a part two. I would love to see like a time skip episode where it's not like Drake and Willie anymore, but it's like a new set of kids and Big Yellow is still at the school, still the mascot. And they're trying to like solve the mystery of Willie. Like Willie was like a, a myth that happened in the school and uh, it would be cool. Sign me up. Sign me up. Let me be a writer for this shit. But now Willie's bum, dumb ass is inside Big Yellow's stomach and the world can finally be at peace. On the real note, this episode is really eerie and creepy. There's a lot of really good tension building scenes and there's no like immediate jump scare. It's just all like tense the whole time and you don't really know what's going to happen until the big reveal of Willie and his stomach. And I actually kind of do like this ending. I, I think Willie gets what he deserves. I think it's like the whole point. Even in like the past Goosebumps like show, the kids always somehow came out on top. But in this show, they're not afraid to kill a kid or two. It's awesome. <laughs> Let me know if you want to see any more episodes of this series. Happy Halloween, by the way. Leave an episode name in the comments below. Tell me how much you like this episode. Like the video if you like the video. Hit subscribe if you want to. Thank you for watching the video. I appreciate you all and... Peace. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the YouTube channel with the squeakiest chair. I'm spinning. I don't know what that was. I have some sad news, guys. This will probably be the last Haunting Hour video I make. I know, I know. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. But just, just for a second, I gotta make other things. People want to see other things on my channel. Let's do this. If this video reaches 50 likes, I'll make another one. A couple of you guys mentioned this episode catching cold. And while I will say this episode's more weird than scary, it does have some creepy elements to it. Don't get me wrong. I will never hear the ice cream jingle the same way again. It is quite interesting and really wacky, and I kind of really do want to talk about it. We start the episode by hearing the classic jingle, and we get to to see the ice cream truck that we'll be witnessing for the rest of the episode. Looks all innocent and stuff. It's got little polka dots on it. It's got this weird, creepy ice cream dude with a face on the front. Don't like the vibes this guy gives off. Then we get a shot of our main character, Marty. Marty is the stereotypical gross fat kid from all TV shows back then. His room is absolutely a mess and he's just lazy and he has candy wrappers flowing out of his pockets. Also, he is played by the same guy that played Rowley in Dire of Wimpy Kid. Ah! One of the greatest movies of all time, and nobody can change my mind about that. Marty hears the ice cream truck coming, but uh-oh, Marty doesn't have any money. So what does he do? He goes asks his mom. And of course she answers with, You know how to earn money. I'll do it later, come on! That's an odd interaction. How does he make his money? How does he make his money? I guess that doesn't matter, so he asks his sister Kayla, who is Patty Mayo from the greatest movie of all time, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Make your move! She's a girl! I grab <laughs> Let me know if you want to hear me talk about Diary of a Kid in the comments below. I'll probably do it anyways without you guys' uh, confirmation. <laughs> anyways, Kayla says no. <laughs> and that just leaves one person. Hello? 
It's his dad. And his dad won't notice if a couple of bucks are just missing out of his wallet. JK, Marty is a good kid and does not steal. Luckily, he does find a dollar in a drawer, though. This kid is free of sins, except for gluttony. That might be the downfall of him. And after all this trouble of trying to get money for the ice cream truck, Marty sadly misses the ice cream truck. And the next day, after a quick game of catch, what, I said it was quick. Marty tells his best friend Ari about the ice cream truck. And suspiciously, Ari never even heard an ice cream truck. Then Marty talks about the ice cream like it's literally heaven on earth, even though he didn't even get any of it. But while they're talking, a postman overhears them and decides to give us some much needed lore. See, there was this kid named Little Jimmy Jeffries, and he would always talk about this amazing ice cream he got. He got the ice cream from a truck called Creamy Cold Ice Cream. Little Jimmy said that he could never actually catch the ice cream truck, but sometimes it would leave him ice cream. And after the first bite or lick, Jimmy was hooked. It was like he was addicted. And he just couldn't shut up about it. He would talk about how delicious this ice cream was, and he would just keep going on until he like almost passed out from talking too much. But one day, little Jimmy disappeared. Probably something we don't have to think about. But seriously, why do kids keep disappearing in this series? It happens like almost every episode, somebody disappears. The mystery. Ooh, the kid went missing. Oh. <laughs> but later that night, Marty hears a song, a familiar song, the ice cream song. He runs outside to see the truck is facing his house and I don't know if I would trust that who knew an ice cream truck could be so menacing Marty looks down to find a perfect ice cream cone sitting on his front porch yeah dude I definitely would not eat that Marty it's probably laced with like crack or something I would not trust it Marty seriously don't eat that oh he's eating the ice cream cone he also moans the whole time he's eating this ice cream cone mm. Mm. it is actually the weirdest thing in this episode probably the series no, it's not, but in this episode, yes. I think the ice cream was actually laced with something because while the truck drives away, Marty just goes into the street yelling, I want more. I want more! Don't do drugs, kids, or eat ice cream that randomly shows up on your doorstep. The next day, the only thing Marty could think and talk about is this creamy cold ice cream. He just talks about how smooth and creamy and delicious it is. Mm. And he doesn't want to leave the spot. Even when his friend Ari invites him to the mall to get his mind off a few things, he turns him down. It's like, I have to stay right here. What if I miss the ice cream truck? But the truck never shows up. He goes home and the man starts licking paper with a drawing of ice cream on it. He's a bit insane already. Maybe I need to get my hands on this ice cream. Maybe he's onto something. That night, Marty gets awakened by the sound of dripping water, but it's dripping a weird tune. That must be a coincidence, so he turns off the water faucet. Okay, that's a bit weird. What's going on here? So he unplugs the alarm clock and... Okay, what the fuck? Marty, I would not go to that ice cream truck. Marty, seriously, I wouldn't go near the ice cream truck. Marty! Oh, thank God. Luckily, Marty's dad steps in and stops him. Marty then tries to explain to his dad what is going on, but when he turns around, the ice cream truck is gone. So Marty comes back inside, closes the door, and then the ice cream truck reappears. And we get to see a glimpse of somebody in the back window. At this point in the episode, Marty is losing sleep. All he can think about and all he wants to do is eat this ice cream. He doesn't understand why no one else can see the ice cream truck. But like our friend Matt Pat, he has a theory. Marty thinks you have to believe in the ice cream truck in order to see the ice cream truck. But he wouldn't believe in the ice cream truck if the ice cream truck didn't pull up to his house the first time because he didn't know it existed. How did he see it the first time? Because if you have to believe it to see it, and obviously if you see something, you're going to believe it's real because you've been seeing it. It doesn't make sense. There's a little bit of a plot hole there. Does that make sense? I, I, I just rambled for a little bit. Does that make any sense? Anyways, Ari tries to talk him down from his theory and then instantly gets insulted. I hate to say it, man, but you're lame. Like, Jesus, bro, this guy's your only friend, the only person I've seen you with besides your family, so I would I would be nice to him. Then Marty talks about wanting literally every bit of ice cream in the world. He wants to fill pools up with it. He wants to drive cars to it and then eat it all. He just wants all the ice cream he can get his grubby little hands on. And again, Ari tries to bring him back to Earth. Like, hey, that's a little weird, man. It's a little gross. But this just pisses Marty off. Cool, Marty. And Marty kicks him out. And if you didn't think Marty was insane yet, let's just take a glimpse into his journal. Yeah, he has creamy cold written in every font imaginable throughout his journal. Kid's insane. And in the very next scene, he is talking to himself. It's Luckily, Marty's dad stops him from having a mental breakdown and brings him a gift. He noticed that Marty felt a little down and has been acting a little weird, so he thought maybe getting a bike would make him happier. And upon receiving this bike, Marty is not worried about it at all. He's more worried about this. You want my blood to pump. What's that? 
It's a spike strip. Blows out the bad guy's tires. See, he wants to use his cop dad's spike strip to throw it across the road and stop the ice cream truck so he can just take as much ice cream as he wants. See, he thinks he has the upper hand on the ice cream truck now, but I think the ice cream truck knows what he's up to. Marty then pulls up to Ari's house and receives yet another gift. Two gifts in one day. And it's his most favorite thing ever. Ice cream. So, of course, he loves the ice cream. <laughs> Okay, he can't eat any other ice cream. Everything else makes him feel sick and he thinks it's gross. And he still just can't stop thinking about this creamy cold ice cream, so he sells Ari the bike he just received from his dad for 20 bucks. Drugs make you do some crazy things, kids. But he offers him the bike for 20 bucks just in case he does catch the ice cream truck. He can buy them out. This is all a hypothetical. He doesn't even know if he's going to catch it. But Ari is somewhat of a good friend. He's like, yeah, here's 20 bucks, I'll take the bike, but you can buy the bike back anytime you want it. He doesn't actually want the bike. That night, after dinner, Marty steals his dad's spike strip and hides behind a bush, waiting for the truck to show up. But it doesn't seem to show up for a long time. And right before Marty gives up, we hear... But it's coming too fast, and, and Marty can't get the spike strip out of the bag fast enough, and... Stop! he misses the ice cream truck again. No worries though, it did see him hiding in the bushes and decides to turn around. And this is when Marty very unsuspiciously throws the spike strap across the road. Yeah, this dude has major slot of hand. I bet, th I bet the truck driver did not see that at all. Did not see you chunk a giant metal thing across the road. And surprisingly, it does work and it gets the truck to stop. And after praying to the truck for some reason, he climbs in through the window where he gets a glimpse of his delicious, delectable ice cream. And a man, a quite gross looking man. This guy is little Jimmy Jeffries. And he's not the truck driver, no, 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 no one is the truck driver. The truck has a mind of its own. See, Jimmy explains to us that the truck waits for somebody to really want some ice cream, hunts them down, gives them free ice cream, it's the most delicious ice cream they've ever had in their life, then lets them chase it, and once they catch it, it steals their soul. So little Jimmy has been in there for 30 years because he was the last one to catch the ice cream truck, and now it's our friend, Marty's turn. Hey! Hey! Let me out! But hey, at least he can finally eat as much ice cream as he wants. Like I said, this one isn't a very scary episode. There is scary elements. I will never hear that ice cream jingle the same again. The ice cream truck somehow was creepy. I didn't know you can make an ice cream truck creepy, but it was. But everything else was just kind of weird. It was just like an obsession thing. This could be used as like a metaphor for drug addiction. But yeah, let me know what you think about this episode in the comments below. Like I said earlier, if this video gets to 50 likes, I'll do another Haunting Hour episode. I do, I do love this series. I just don't want my channel to be just loaded with every episode of the haunting hour so i want to try to do more things let me know what other things you want to see me talk about anyways that's all i got for you guys today thank you for watching the video i appreciate you all and peace yeah Hello everybody and welcome to the Haunting Hour channel. This is the channel where I only talk about the Haunting Hour because you guys won't let me escape. On a real note, I asked for a, a measly 50 likes on the last video, expecting it to take a few days because the previous video I made wasn't even at 50 likes when I made that video. You guys crushed that in four hours. You guys are crazy. But seriously guys, thank you so much for all the support on this series. I will definitely keep doing this as long as you guys are interested in it. Anyways, enough about me. Let's talk about what we're gonna be talking about today. I decided to look over some of the episodes of The Haunting Hour just to see which ones look interesting, which ones maybe you guys want to see me do. And I set up a poll, and in that poll, I put Afraid of Clowns, I put Scary Mary, and then I put the movie. Honestly, I thought Afraid of Clowns was gonna win. You guys talk about Afraid of Clowns so much, but surprisingly, Scary Mary won. And I don't know why this episode has not been recommended to me at all. I don't know if it scared you guys so bad that you guys wiped it from your memory, because this is definitely the scariest episode of The Haunting Hour I have seen. Beats everybody. It beats Lily D. It's also a two-parter, which makes it even better because this video is going to be a little bit longer than the last ones. Anyways, let's get into it. The episode starts out with our main character, Hannah, and a few of her friends looking at pictures. When her friends notice that Hannah's not in a lot of pictures, that's because Hannah is insecure. She's so insecure about herself that she doesn't even like looking in a mirror. She's covered her mirror in pictures of her and her friends. Anyways, her friends get bored and they want to find something to do. So one of them offers up a little game, a little spooky game. What's the game called, you might ask? It's, it's Scary Mary. It's the title of the episode. If you didn't guess that, you're just stupid. The friend that offered it up is new to town. Apparently he's from Michigan or something where they play this all the time. Shout out to my Michigan fans out there. But the game is pretty much Bloody Mary, but instead of saying Bloody Mary three times, you say this little chant. Scary Mary looking through. 
Scary Mary, she sees you. Scary Mary looking through. Scary Mary, she's got you. And she's supposed to come through the mirror and steal you. So that's fun. And kind of like real life, this Mary figure was a real person. Legend has it that she lived on a farm deep in the woods a long time ago. The farm was in the middle of nowhere and she had no friends. She was very lonely. She was so lonely that she would dress up and look at herself in the mirror. And she became so obsessed with herself that she just never stopped looking at herself in the mirror. Until one day, the farmhouse caught on fire. But she was too infatuated with herself that she never even noticed that she was on fire. And she burned to death. I'm just the prettiest girl. No one's prettier than me getting kind of hot in here. Now she waits behind a mirror, waiting for pretty girls so she can steal their face. Steal their face. Just, just their face, by the way. Well, now the teens obviously want to play this game, but Hannah's mirror is just so covered in pictures it wouldn't possibly work. Oh yeah, that boy is Eric. He's important. He has a crush on Hannah. <laughs> Sadly, Hannah's mom comes in and ruins the fun and kicks the boys out because she's gonna go out with the girls herself. And while their mom is out, the girls do play the Scary Mary game in the bathroom. But you have to be alone to play the game and none of them really want to do it by themselves. So they draw cards, but uh-oh, Hannah pulls the short straw. See, the joke there was that they're not using cards or straws, they're using a sticky note with a circle on it. But I used cards and straws because that's usually what people would use. That's the joke. Am I funny yet? So Hannah has to go and do the game by herself. She goes in the bathroom, turns the light out, says the chant, and nothing happens. But wait, where did her friends go? All right. It's funny. I'm gonna kill you guys. She looks around her house, but her friends can't be found anywhere. And when she tries looking in the closet, we get a glimpse of something in the mirror. Oh, it was just her friends. Never mind. We should have known it was fake. What the fuck is that? I scared the shit out of my cat. I'm sorry. Nah, burn it. Burn the house. Burn the house down. Just burn the house down. Just treat her like Mary. Mary wants to burn that. Just burn the house. So we do get glimpses of Mary throughout this episode. She's always in the mirror, of course. And it doesn't get any less scary. It only scared me more when I watched it. I think I'm going to pee my pants. The next day, Hannah's hanging out by herself in this place they call the Crook when Eric comes to check on her. Because she's been acting a little strange lately. It's almost like she's in a daze and she's been thinking about Mary a lot. And she feels really bad for Mary. She thinks that Mary just wants to see girls look pretty. She tells all this to Eric, but Eric is just kind of like, yeah, okay, the scary Mary, whoop de doo And he walks her home. And when Hannah gets home, she immediately looks in a mirror. And then she smiles at herself and then... I'm not gonna lie, guys. That jump scare got me twice. I hate myself. Anyways, Hannah goes out with the rest of her day. She takes a shower, and when she gets out of the shower, Mary decides to go ahead and shoot her shot at Hannah. Sadly, Hannah didn't notice. Hannah's mom comes home and is angry at Hannah for not doing her chores, and she grounds her until she finishes her chores. So obviously, Hannah starts doing her chores, and while she's doing her chores, she finds an antique hairbrush laying on the ground. Upon picking it up, she hears and now sees Mary in the mirror. And this is when Mary starts to control Hannah. She makes her leave her house, go out, and buy makeup to make herself prettier. But she didn't tell her mom or anybody where she was going and Eric finds her on the street still in a little bit of a daze. Eric asks her what's she thinking, why is she out by herself and didn't tell anybody. She starts talking about how she feels bad for Mary and she just wants to buy some makeup to make herself pretty to make Mary happy. Obviously, Eric still doesn't believe her until she shows him the hairbrush. Which he still doesn't really believe her, but he kind of wants to. Cut to Hannah back at home. She takes off all the pictures on her mirror and starts talking to Mary in the mirror. Well, Mary and a few others. While Hannah's doing her makeup, she uses Mary's brush to brush her hair, and this finalizes the game. Then we get this insane scene. And that's the end of episode one. Absolutely insane. This is the season finale for season one, by the way. Did not think it was gonna go this hard. This episode felt like it was like five seconds when I was watching it. I was like, there's no way that's over already. <laughs> and the jump scares, dude. Anyways, buckle up because it only gets crazier from here. Episode 2 starts off with Hannah waking up in a mysterious place and wearing a dress that she has never seen before. She is locked in this room and she can see her mom and friends through the mirror in the room, but she can't talk to them, they can't hear her. A girl comes into the room wearing a creepy doll mask and brings Hannah some tea. She tells her a few things like, they can't hear you, you can scream as loud as you want, and then she tells her to shush and then she leaves and locks the door behind her. Eric shows up and Hannah starts yelling for him to no avail, but Eric knows something 
is up somehow. I don't know how. He knows things are a little weird when he finds the brush on the floor. So he takes the brush and a part of the mirror and takes it to his friend. He tries to convince his friend that Anna wasn't kidnapped by a person. She was kidnapped by Scary Mary. And of course, his friend doesn't believe him. His friend also calls him crazy for taking evidence from the site. That, that, that is evidence and he did take it. So it's a little bit of a crime. And his friend thinks that Hannah just ran away. But Eric won't take that for an answer. Hannah's not that way. Later, another creepy girl comes into Hannah's room and brings her three doll masks. This is where we learn that Hannah is in Mary's world. All these girls in the masks have also played the Scary Mary game and was taken from their home by Mary. The girl tells Hannah to pick a mask because she's gonna need one and then she says something a little odd. She told me they are all different. But never mind that, Hannah doesn't want a mask. She wants to go home. The scary girl says that she must choose a mask because Mary doesn't like looking at the faces. That's a little weird. What do you guys look? Oh my God. This is actually probably the scariest screenshot from the whole series. I cannot believe that this got through the people that let things get through. I forgot what they're called. So yeah, Mary actually does steal their face and leaves them looking like this. After Hannah rips off her mask, the scary girl obviously is very upset and says, When it's your turn, you won't want anyone looking at your face. And the girl storms off, locking Hannah back in the room again. Back in the real world, Eric and their friends meet up at the crook, where the friends try to convince Eric to give the hairbrush to the police, but Eric won't. And he somehow convinces them that Mary stole Hannah and that he needs to play the game so that he can go save her. And he needs the brush to do this. Then we get one of the creepiest scenes I've ever seen in my life. Then Mary proceeds to try on different girls' faces and asks a weird question. Has any boy come to call on me tonight? This question is confusing at first, but luckily I'm here to tell you guys what it means. So since Mary died in a fire, this world that they're in is made of fire. And the only way to get back home is this pond that's in the world. But they can't just walk across the pond, no, they have to be carried by a boy. And Mary steals these girls' faces so that she can pretend to be the girls so she can go back to the real world. Eric and the crew set up a seance in the woods so that they can play the game. Except this time it'll be Eric alone, and he doesn't know what he's gonna do if he gets there. He's going in completely blind. And when he plays the game, it actually works and he sees Hannah for a split second before the mirror explodes in his face. This sends him to Mary's world. Now Eric can find Hannah before the girls hang her? What? Oh, never mind. They just use it to tie her up and walk her to the farmhouse. Okay. Whew. I just got scary for a second there. I don't know what I would have done if they actually just hung Hannah in this episode. That would have been crazy. They bring Hannah to Mary where Mary starts asking her questions about her beauty. But remember, Hannah is very insecure about herself and doesn't think she's beautiful at all. And since Hannah didn't choose a mask, the girls get to choose one for her. So they strap her down to a chair, pull her hair back, and force a mask on her face. But before the face stealing finishes, Eric actually hears her scream. When he hears the scream, he starts running towards the scream and calling out for Hannah. This is when Mary sees Eric outside and gets a little excited that a boy's finally showed up. Finally, after a hundred years, Mary's gonna be saved. Eric finds his way into the house and he goes upstairs to find Hannah knocked out in the chair. Luckily, he saved her before Mary took her face. This is when Hannah explains to Eric how they can escape this world, but Hannah didn't know how to escape the world. I guess that doesn't matter, maybe a little bit of a plot hole, but instead, Hannah wants to hear how beautiful she is. Well, really, I say that, but she actually wants to hear this. Yeah, everyone wants to look at my face. But my face is the most beautiful face in all of creation. The way you look upon my face, you wish to never look away. Then my lips are perfectly curved. Then my nose tilts gracefully. Then my eyes dance with color. But the blush on my cheek is more glorious than the dawn. Pretty much, she just wants to hear that she's beautiful, okay? But wait! Hannah doesn't think she's beautiful. Hannah wouldn't say that. She hates the way she looks and Eric knows this, so he presses her a little bit. And this makes her so mad that the room catches on fire. And we also get a look at the true scary Mary. Then all the other girls swarm the room, start pulling on Eric, telling him that they're Hannah and they want to go. All this happens while Mary is playing Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, I think that's the one it is, let me know in the comments below, while the room burns down. And in this absolute chaos, Eric hears Hannah crying for help in the chest in the room. This is when Eric picks her up and tries to carry her out of the room, but I think Mary is just a little bit jealous. Take her. She's ugly. She has no face. But they make it out alive. Eric carries Hannah across the pond back into the real world where their friends have already accepted their death for some reason and they've just lit up candles nice and stuff around the tree. But it's all good now. Hannah is home, Eric is home, and everybody can live happily ever after. A girl 
has come to call. And that's the end of the episode. That's the end of the story. The crazy, absolutely insane story this one is. You guys mentioned mascot and stuff so much. I had to make a video on that. But no, this one's the actual goaded episode. Why didn't you guys tell me about Scary Mary? <laughs> What's wrong with you guys? Once again, thank you guys for all the support in these videos. Like I said, I'm going to keep making them as long as you guys are interested. So let me know which episodes you want to see in the comments below or any other series you want to see me make a video on. Thank you for watching the video. I appreciate every single one of you. And... Peace. Hello everybody and welcome to a spooky time with King Noosme. So last week I set up a poll and I asked you guys to vote between the three most requested haunting hour episodes. And I'm not gonna lie, out of the three, I thought Dreamcatcher was gonna win, but Scarecrow, he barely squeaked it out. There was a time when it was like 48 and 49%. It was, it was quite close. It was crazy. I do want to let you guys know that this episode is not as scary. It has scary elements, trust me. It, it is kind of freaky, but the ending of it is just kind of sad. I... I don't know what to tell you. It just leaves me with dread. It's awesome. We start the episode on a peaceful farm when we get to meet our main character, Jenny, who is played by our favorite reoccurring actress, Bailey Madison. She's having trouble with crows eating her crops. Her dad gave her an acre of land so that she can learn how hard it is to make money growing crops. And obviously she's having a rough time. This is when her older brother, Bobby, chimes in and talks about how easy it is to herd cattle. All you gotta do is go out there, give them some hay, and they, they eat it. That's all you gotta do with them. See, he's gonna use those cattle to sell for meat to make a lot of money. So he has the easy job in the family. But nobody just sits around, everybody helps out in this family, so while Bobby's not doing anything, he has to run to the store and get some chicken feed. Which he will gladly do, because he has a crush on the cashier. Jenny even calls her Emo Amy, because she has bangs, and she listens to rock music. Me and Jenny have different ideas of emo people. Because tonight will be the night that I will fall for you! Cut to the store, and Amy is listening to a song that kind of slaps. Wait, does that make me emo? Anyway, she's listening to her music too loud and doesn't hear them come in and they kind of scare her a little bit. Jenny points out that she's a little jumpy today and it's because she's been reading these creepy poems out of this book. And she starts reading a poem called The Hollow Men to them out loud. And this is an actual poem. I guess the person that wrote this episode read the poem and then decided to make this episode around the poem. Kind of sick. If you want to read it, here it is right here. Take a second, pause it. Cool. She starts reading the poem to them when a creepy man interrupts her to finish the poem for her. Our dry voices, when we whisper together, are quiet. He then asks the kids if they know the true meaning of the poem. See, the poem seems like it's about scarecrows, but no, it's really about the end of the world. He then talks about how he doesn't understand why people are so edgy and touchy about talking about the end of the world. He then pays for his jerky and leaves, but not without pointing out how loud the bell is. Loud, ain't it? That night, Bobby's dog looks scared and hides underneath Bobby's bed. That's when we see the stranger that was in the store earlier is outside of their house, kind of watching it. Very creepy. And the next day, his car is still there when Jenny gets dropped off for school. He pulls into the driveway and talks to her for a second, but we don't get to hear that conversation. All we get to see is him leaving as Bobby pulls in. So Bobby pulls in and asks Jenny what was going on there. The strange man asked her if they have any pests, which Jenny does. He told her that he has a scarecrow so scary it'll scare anything away. And we do see that Jenny now has a sack over her shoulder that she didn't have before. Bobby understandably tells her to never talk to him again. He's probably not a good guy. He's not a creep. He just wanted to help. He's nice. Oh yeah, he's nice. He looked so nice yesterday when you were trembling behind your big brother. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but Bobby in a more serious brotherly tone. He tells her that if he comes around again, you come get me or dad. The siblings in this show are awesome. They had they wrote great siblings in this show. He then points out the sack and asks her what it is. Something for a school project. But she lies to him and tells him it's just a homework. It's just a homework? Yeah, okay. It's just a little something for homework. He doesn't need to worry about it. Later that night, Ginny, alone in the barn, makes the scarecrow. You are a scary scarecrow. We wouldn't be of much help if you weren't, though. After she stuffs him with straw, she goes to grab a post to put him on. But when she walks back in, the scarecrow is not there. Furious, she runs inside to ask her brother if he took her scarecrow. But before she can say anything, he asks about his dog, because he hasn't seen his dog all day. But she doesn't really care about that. She knows that his dog will probably turn up. She is more worried about her missing scarecrow. And when she asks Bobby about it, he 
doesn't know what she's talking about. He then realizes what's going on and that she lied to him earlier. He told her not to take anything from the strange man, but she took this scarecrow anyways and lied about it. So they go outside to talk about it. Bobby asked their parents if they've seen a scarecrow and they said no, they didn't know what they were talking about. And then he just mentioned that Jenny's thinking about getting one, that nothing you need to worry about. So he kind of covered for her, which is another good brother thing. And while they're outside, they start talking about the scarecrow and like what could have happened to it. Maybe some bullies took it or something. That's when they notice that there's no noises outside. It's almost completely silent. There's not even crickets. Which if you didn't know, that's kind of weird. Like if, if it's just silent outside, something's up. The next day, Jeannie goes outside to scare the birds away with her little doohickey thingamajig. But as she's rotating the thing, no birds fly away. And it looks like her crops haven't been eaten either. That's all thanks to the scarecrow that ended up in her field. But she didn't put it there. She runs to get Bobby and Bobby has a great question. How'd it get there? If we knew how it got there, Bobby, we wouldn't be here right now, right? Bobby suggests that they burn the scarecrow because it creeps him out. Sounds like a great idea to me. But Ginny absolutely hates the idea. It's helping keep the crows away, so it must be doing its job. Later that evening, Bobby takes some hay out to the cows, but when he gets out there, the cows aren't in the field. Oh, huh, that's kind of weird. But back in town, Amy goes to a local diner, and while she's in line, she notices a familiar face leaving the store. Hmm, that's a little weird. Oh well, it must be nothing. We cut back to Ginny picking her corn by herself in the field when she hears rustling in the corn. It sounds like it's coming up behind her, and fast, and it, it's just her brother Bobby. He's looking for his cattle and their parents. Their parents seem to have gone missing too. But before Ginny can say anything, he gets a call from Amy. Wait a minute, is that the meme ringtone? It is, that's awesome. <laughs> Amy calls him crying that she has this cold feeling inside of her and that she's feeling really weird right now. She then proceeds to say the most confusing thing I've ever heard in my life. It's this cold feeling, it's cold like the grave, but it's not like death and it's not like life either. And when she looks up, she sees the scarecrow on the church steeple. She then screams and the phone hangs up. Now Bobby is concerned and decides to go head into town to try and find her. And when he gets there, he finds the town completely empty no noise. The only noise is coming from the music in the diner. But he does find Amy's phone laying on the sidewalk. And as he's looking for anybody in town, Ginny calls him again and she says that the scarecrow is now gone. And about this time, this is when Bobby hears a car driving through the town. And would you guess it? It's the strange man driving. Bobby tells Ginny to run inside and go lock all the doors. But by the time he tells her this, it's already too late. Ginny hears footsteps creeping towards her in the corn. And no matter where she goes, she comes face to face with... After some time, she finally makes it out of the cornfield, and as she's running to the house, she sees the strange man's car parked outside in their driveway. And when she runs inside, she sees a long trail of hay going throughout their house. That means that the scarecrow somehow got inside their house before she did. So now nowhere is safe, and Jeannie decides to just make a run for it outside, but... The scarecrow meets her at the door. Sorry to break your immersion. It's uh, really intense right now, I understand, but Bailey Madison's acting in this scene is insane. It's like top tier, too good for television acting. Like it is crazy good. She's probably one of the best child actors I've seen in my life. After that, Bobby makes it home to see the scarecrow sitting at the kitchen table. And it looks like it's been waiting for him, but he kind of ignores it. He starts calling out to Jenny. He needs to find his sister. That's when suddenly the stranger appears where the scarecrow was. Bobby turns and asks him what happened to his sister, but the stranger doesn't care right now. He just wants Bobby to listen to the silence, the peace. You hear that? Nothing. Lovely stillness. But Bobby doesn't care about that right now. He wants to know where his sister is. That's when the stranger says, Gone, gone. Everyone's gone. He says that it's no one's fault and it's always meant to be this way. And he wanted to share the peace of the end of the world with somebody. And that somebody is Bobby. He then creepily recites the poem from earlier in almost complete silence before showing us two scarecrows guarding the corn. One of them, the strange man, the other one, is Bobby. So yeah, this episode's depressing and uh, makes me think about things I don't want to think about. I think it's a little too deep for children to think this hard about the end of the world, but I'm, I'm glad they made this episode. It's such a good episode. It doesn't have a, a big grandiose ending like Mascot or even Scary Mary, but it kind of ends in line with the end of the world in the show. It's kind of very calm if you will. <laughs> Doesn't make it any less fucking strange that he got turned into a scarecrow and what happened to literally everybody else? Did they just disappear or something? Or did they also get turned into scarecrows? 
I don't know. They didn't really explain that very well. So yeah, that was the end of Scarecrow. Let me know what you think about it in the comments below. Also comment down below any other episodes you want to see me talk about. I think I've pretty much gotten every episode as a recommendation to talk about. Let me know any other shows or any other episodes in a certain show you want to see me talk about. How about that? Thank you for watching the video all the way through. I appreciate you all and... Peace. Hello everybody and welcome to Somebody's Coming After You Right Now. You're dreaming. You have to wake up. You have to wake up right now. You're dreaming. He's going to come to you. He's coming up the stairs. He's opening the door. He's opening the door. A few weeks ago, I put up a poll to ask about the next Haunting Hour video and it was a very fair poll. People were saying it's rigged. I don't get how this is rigged. It doesn't look rigged to me. But not only did Dreamcatcher win, Dreamcatcher is one of the most requested episodes to watch. So I decided to give it a shot. And you guys were hyping it up a lot for it to be... One of the best episodes of The Haunting Hour, you guys are right. We start the episode by, of course, meeting the main character, Lisa, and she's going to summer camp for the first time. When she gets on the bus, she sits across from these girls named Amelia and Meg. Amelia seems excited for camp. She's ready to make a bunch of new friends, but Meg is not excited at all. She hates this camp, and she's only going because her parents have to work. I don't think Meg's parents actually have to go to work. I think they just need a break from their child because she is a... She's a lot. She's a huge narcissist and wants her and Amelia to ditch the other campers and be annoying, I guess. I don't know what her plan was. But Amelia had to deal with her last year and she's a little tired of her shit. So she ditches Meg to talk to Lisa. And this is when they become best friends quite quickly. They get to the camp and all the girls get assigned to the same cabin. And now that they're in there, they get to choose bunk beds. So obviously Lisa and Amelia get the same bunk. Just kidding, Meg ruins that too. And she tries to talk shit about Amelia behind her back, but Lisa's not taking it. Don't get fooled by her Little Miss Sunshine act. Amelia's a total jerk once you get to know her. She seems pretty nice to me. Next, they start making their dream catchers. Their counselor teaches them how to make a proper dream capture with the bead in the middle that they call a spider. Let me know if they actually call that a spider. I know it's like supposed to be a web to catch your dreams, but I never knew the bead was called a spider. I just, they just called it the bead. Anyways, Lisa finishes her dream catcher and apparently it's perfect. Doesn't look too perfect to me. But Meg doesn't like that Lisa is getting praise for her dream catcher. So that night she cuts the bead that's in the middle of her dream catcher. And then she uses this to tell the story of the dream catcher. The story goes that 20 years ago, a camper died at this camp in her sleep. She had nightmares, more like night terrors. Every night she'd wake up screaming because she saw this boogeyman they called the dream catcher. The dream catcher would take away any good dream she had and leave her with only nightmares. And when she tried to tell people about them, they just never believed her. So one night the girl stopped sleeping and she started to go a little bit insane. She started to see the dream catcher everywhere even when she wasn't sleeping and one night she did accidentally go to sleep and the next morning the counselors found her frozen in time with a look of terror on her face. Ah! <laughs> then their counselor comes in and somehow convinces Lisa that it's not a true story. You don't believe in boogeyman do you? But after she asks her that, then she tells the campers, yeah, the story was true, but it happened such a long time ago before any of them were even born. Still not okay that somebody died at this camp and they're just kind of trying to keep it on the down low. I guess that's like the only rational thing to do, actually, rather than, you know, close the camp down. But then she says something uh, quite odd. Plus, girls have your dream catchers, right? And that night, Lisa has nightmares of this creature with long fingers stalking her, reaching out, trying to grab her. She can feel his presence, but doesn't know where he's at. So she tries to go find her counselors to get help. And when she walks into the cabin to talk to them, we get this scene. <laughs> girls. Actually, terrified by this, Lisa runs out to be greeted by and then she wakes up to Meg yapping in her ear and a weird scratch on her arm. Later that day, Amelia talks to Lisa about how her and Meg used to be friends, but she was super weird about it. She couldn't really do anything she wanted and she would get very angry if Amelia talked to any of the other girls. And then she also talks about having a weird dream last night as well. In Amelia's dream, she was trapped in this cave that's on the campgrounds and it felt like she was stuck against something and she couldn't move. She was trying to get out when she felt something brush across her. And when she looked up, she saw this hideous monster with really long fingers and he walked like a spider. That's when the girls realize that they've been dreaming of the same monster. When they go back to the cabin, the girls find that both of their dream catchers have been broken. And you wouldn't guess who broke them. You cut them. And when they tell the counselor, the counselor just believes them immediately. Meg, cut our dream catchers. Meg, kitchen duty for three days. Later that night, Lisa and Amelia are too scared to go to sleep because they don't want to dream of this monster anymore. They're afraid the dream catcher might come back. So they decide to get into the same bed and stay up all night. And of course it works, no dream catcher. But the rest of the girls wake up to Justine busting through the cabin saying, All right girls, big day plan today, 20 mile canoe trip. 20 mile canoe trip? 
20 miles? That's like 15 hours. That's the longest canoe trip ever. But before they leave for their 20 mile canoe trip, Lisa decides to get a little payback on Meg and cuts her bead as well. Anyways, they somehow survive exhaustion and they gather around a campfire and start singing little campfire songs. R-C-A-M-P-F-I-R-E-S-O-N-G song. This is when the girls start singing the song, There Was an Old Lady That Swallowed a Spider. And as they're singing this, all the girls get up and start surrounding Lisa. They get closer to her and closer and closer until... But luckily it was a dream, or was it? Because Lisa has spider webs coming out of her mouth. Lisa tries to explain everything to Amelia and Meg, but Meg really doesn't care and she doesn't want to be around them. So she decides she's going to go to sleep in the mess hall, which is like a lunchroom for people that don't know what that is. Lisa and Amelia chug some soda and eat some chocolate and try to stay up all night. And they, they treat it like it's like drugs. Like they drink this soda and it's like the hardest thing for them to like take down. <laughs> gonna choke down this Coke. I'm gonna fuck it. I gotta stay up all night. I wish one Coke would keep me up all night, dude. I gotta I could drink two Red Bulls and still be tired. I'd still fall asleep five minutes later. Is that an issue? Is that a problem? Do I have a problem? But in the middle of the night, Lisa decides to go to the bathroom by herself. She might have went by herself, but she's not alone. She runs back to the cabin to find Amelia dead asleep, but the dream catcher hovering over her stealing her soul, I think? But after he sucks her soul out of her body, he does the scariest thing probably this whole season. <laughs> Lisa then runs to the woods and starts hearing Amelia call for her. And she's calling for her from the cave. But before she can go into the cave, Meg wakes her up. Apparently she was screaming so loud that Meg could hear her all the way in the mess hall. But if that's the case, don't they sleep with like a bunch of other little girls? Did none of them hear her screaming? Or are they just too nice to not wake her up? How did she scream so loud that Meg heard her but nobody else? But Lisa's not worried about her screaming right now. Lisa's more worried about Amelia that's stuck in the cave. She asks Meg to help her get Amelia out, but Meg doesn't care. She's not her friend anymore. Not my friend. Not my problem. So Lisa decides to go in alone. Just kidding, Meg does tag along. She does care about them after all. Just kidding, she doesn't. She ditches them almost immediately. And she does this to try to get back at them somehow. You just said, yeah, I'll help. See you later. What? That doesn't, what is, what is that going to do to them? Lisa goes into the cave and finds Amelia stuck to this enormous spider web. But her walking around the spider web alerted somebody else. When they try to run, the webs are too sticky and they get stuck. But luckily, Meg is here to save the day. She helps them get out. They all hug and become best friends. Just kidding, she falls too. <laughs> and as the dream catcher is creeping towards them slowly, being all weird and creepy and with the scary eyes, I hate those fucking eyes, Lisa's alarm goes off and wakes up Amelia and Lisa, but not Meg. Meg is asleep in the mess hall. So she's stuck there with the dream catcher alone and presumably dies. Another death that I am willing to accept in this haunting hour series, right behind Willie. <laughs> And that's the end of the episode. This one felt a little shorter than the other ones, but it had a bigger impact on me. If this one was a two-parter to like fully flesh out the scary d dream catcher, it would have been really cool to see. Some of these episodes did deserve two-parters and some of the two-parters did not deserve two-parters. But let me know what you think about it in the comments below. I do want to say that the suspense and jump scares in this episode alone, top tier, like probably the best in the series. The dream catcher design, he's creepy. He's super long-legged, has those long fingers and walks weird, has a disgusting face, disgusting hair. I love him, he's my best friend. But I did notice a few things that kinda don't make sense. So the girls chug the sodas to stay up all night. Then literally the next scene, Lisa leaves to go to the bathroom and then the dream catcher's there. So I guess she falls asleep. There's some things they could have like, just, you know, like showed her get back in bed and fall asleep and it would've made sense. But in my brain, I was like, oh, she's just in the woods now, wide awake. And the dream catcher is now real. And then it happened a few times. And at the end of it, the girls could have easily just woken up and then ran and woke up Meg before she died. Lord knows if they would make it, but they could have tried. Oh, it would have been sick if the girls got up and ran and then Meg was dead. I guess I couldn't show a, a dead child on television. Never mind. That would have been cool though. If like she was just laying there dead in the mess hall and then it was like like the girl 20 years ago. Full circle, bitch. A few plot holes here and there, but you know what? What story doesn't have a few plot holes? Am I right? Thank you guys for recommending this episode. A really, really good episode. Let me know what episodes you want to see me talk about in the comments below. I will give you guys a little hint on the next episode i'm gonna talk about it a little seasonal episode i'm gonna talk about a little seasonal episode thank you for watching the video like the video if you like the video i appreciate you all and peace merry christmas everybody you better say it back or i'm gonna send a little grimly goblin dude to your house and he's going to kill you you're going to die
you're not going to escape. My name is King Noosme. On a hunt for little Christmas things to talk about, I found out that there are actually two haunting hour shows that are technically Christmas episodes, but one of them is very obviously a Christmas episode, so we're going to be talking about that one today. This episode is called A Creature Was Stirring, and I would like to tell you that it's one of the better episodes of The Haunting Hour, but it's not. It's not. I'm sorry. If you like this episode, that's great. I, after watching it four times, I've grown to like it a little bit myself, but it's a hard watch your first time. But I will say it's probably one of the wildest episodes of The Haunting Hour in terms of things happening, I, I will say. It's crazy. It's one of the few ones where the parents actually see what's going on too, which is cool. You know things are intense when the parents of these child scary shows are uh, freaking out as well. So we start the episode out with an adorable little kid named Tim. Timmy. He's going around his house waking everybody up because it's Christmas. He might be excited about Christmas, but literally nobody else in his family is. Too early. What time is it? When he gets downstairs and looks at the Christmas tree, he says uh, quite a cliche line, if you ask me. Oh, please, Santa, give me the one thing I asked for. The first to come downstairs are the parents, and they don't even make it about halfway before they have to stop to have a conversation. They don't really say much to each other, but it does say a lot about their situation. It's very tense between the two of them, if you, you catch what I'm dripping. There's no love left. They're separated. They're getting a divorce. They're getting a divorce. What do you want me to say? They obviously haven't told the kids yet, but they're wanting to have one last Christmas before they break the news to them. Next, we get to meet the other siblings, Becky and Mark, and they are what boomers think Gen Z is. They come down separately, but they both come down on their phone or talking to the phone, talking about social media, blah, 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 blah. Kids these days, they always on their phones. They never look up on their phone. I implore you to watch your grandmother next time you're at her house. Guarantee you she's on the phone more than you. They're just like, oh, Becky made cheesecake. Oh, did you see Mike had an accident? So sad. Hope he's okay. Look at this recipe. They're always on their fucking phone. <laughs> They're also super rude for no reason at all. Pretty quickly, they both get their phones taken away and they also get into a fight in the middle of the living room and break one of little Timmy's toys. What are you doing? Hey, hey that's oh, my cousin. On. Also, this is kind of a useless thing to tell you, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. Little Timmy, he just says things sometimes. He just, he just says things. It's I think it's to give him more lines in the show. I, I don't know, make him feel more important. So the family take a family photo and then they start opening their gifts. Mark, he gets a new iPod for Christmas and he's so happy. Dad, I said pad, not pod. Oh yeah, he's an asshole. I forgot about that. And seriously, four gigs? That won't hold even half my tunes. Four gigs? Four gigs can only hold half of your song. How many songs do you have? How long are these songs you have? Lethal Company is a whole video game. That was about four gigs. And it, it's a lot better than probably 20 songs. Or how many fucking songs you have? How many songs do you have? Next up is Becky. And she gets this cute dress from her mom. And she absolutely loves- I can't wear this. Why are you so mean to your parents? They did nothing wrong. No wonder they're getting a divorce. Luckily, little Timmy is actually thankful for his gift. And you know what it is? It's a 500 piece puzzle that he offers his brother to help him with. Not even if you paid me. He's only four, just give him some love, please. After being an ass all day, Mark storms upstairs because he can't have his phone back. Then their mom blames their dad for spoiling the kids and making them this way and she storms off. Then Becky asks if they can go return the dress and she can buy something new. But the dad says no because your mother bought you that dress and you're gonna wear it. And she also storms off with the dad chasing her, leaving little Timmy in the living room all by himself. Or is he? Suddenly a blizzard hits their house and blows their front door open. Then a bright light flies past Timmy, leading him to one last present under the tree. And it seems to have something alive in it. Timmy grabs it and puts it on the table when it starts to growl and rattle a lot. And when Timmy takes a peek inside, we get to see a glimpse of the monster. The monster then tips the present over, grabs Mark's new iPod, and then rips it to shreds. Literally shreds. We then get a good look of the monster. Is that a baby gremlin with wings? Then the storm gets worse, and even worse than that, nobody believes Timmy that there's a monster in the house. After trying to talk to his parents about it, they brush him off, and then we get to learn a little bit more about their divorce. This was going to be their last Christmas as a family, and they wanted it to be nice, but it's just been a huge disaster. Oh, if they only knew what's about to happen to them. Timmy goes back into the living room to find that everything has been destroyed, and the monster is no longer in the box. Timmy runs upstairs to his brother's room, but before he gets there, he finds that the upstairs is also demolished. He runs to his brother's room and tells him about the monster, and the brother replies with, I know, I'm looking right at it. Then he finds out that Timmy was not lying at all, because the monster is in his sheets. Kind of a freaky little monster. Ooh, under the sheets. So he quickly pulls the sheets off and, where'd the monster go? 
<laughs> this is also when we learn that the monster has acid spit. Great, he can fly, move stupid fast, somehow teleport, and he has acid spit. Great, cool, awesome. The boys, scared, run to their sister's room and try to explain it to her, and she obviously doesn't believe them. Even with noises coming out of her closet, she doesn't believe them. But she does soon find out that there is, in fact, a little monster in her closet. <laughs> The boys capture the monster in Becky's blankets. Oh. Wow, that little guy's strong. Mark tries stopping the monster, but it's just too strong and crazy, and it's totally not his arm in a blanket, because that would be very noticeable and stupid. They finally get it to calm down a bit, and when they try to find it, they see this. Where'd he go? Where is it? It has escaped again. Come on, the thing's literally the size of a rat. Just crush it. Scared, the kids back out of the room and try to rationalize everything that's happening to them. But the parents heard the commotion upstairs and they think the kids are fighting. So they run upstairs and find this. What is going on up here? The upstairs is a giant mess. Timmy tries to tell them once again about the monster and so does the other kids, but the parents don't believe them. And as they're arguing, the family picks up all these papers that are on the floor when Becky finds a confidential file. So that obviously means pick it up and read it, right? And when she reads it, she finds out that their parents are getting a divorce, which is a huge shock to the kids, but they don't have time to worry about that right now because there's commotion going on downstairs. The parents go downstairs to find out what's going on and the kids stay upstairs and they apologize for being little assholes to each other. Oh, it's kind of wholesome. The parents go down to the basement to find that the monster has destroyed everything down there as well. And as they look, everything is very quiet and they try to think of an animal that could have possibly done this. Could a small bear do this? Yes, Janice, a baby bear somehow snuck past your whole family, got into your basement, destroyed it, and is now taking refuge somewhere in your house. Yes. She soon finds out that it is not a bear after all. <laughs> And the monster accidentally catches these Christmas lights on fire. Now that the parents finally believe the kids, the parents try to get them out of the front door, but... Oh. <laughs> looks like there's no way out of here. And all their phones are either broken or don't work, and all the doors and windows are sealed, frozen shut. And worst of all, the monster is trying to burn down the basement door with his acid spit, which he succeeds at. <laughs> The family run upstairs and hides in the attic. They then put a bunch of heavy stuff over the door so the little monster can't get in. And this is when Becky decides it's a perfect time to mention a horror movie she saw with her friends where the people got stuck in the attic. What happened to them? They ate each other. Great. Now Timmy thinks he's going to be dinner tonight. Thanks, Becky. The parents assure the kids that they're going to be safe. They're going to make it out of this. And they all huddle together with a blanket to keep warm. And this is when the monster casually turns the dial to their oven all the way up. He's going to blow them up. No jokes, no lie, he's going to blow them up. He's trying to kill this family by blowing them up in their own house. And while they're none the wiser, they start talking about a camping trip that happened a few years ago that was almost as bad as this. That's one horrible camping trip, if you ask me. But after they get done reminiscing on old times, Timmy asks, Can we go camping again now that I'm old enough to remember? Sure. Yeah. And the parents don't look too thrilled about this idea, bud. And this is when Timmy realizes that they're never going to go camping as a family anymore. And he finishes this statement off by saying, it Doesn't feel like we're a family anymore. And the parents finally admit to the kids that, yeah, we're getting a divorce. And Timmy apologizes for some reason and tries to say, What if I tried to be better? But the parents assure him that it's not his fault that they're getting a divorce. It's the other two. No, I'm just kidding. They've just fallen out of love. And ever since they have, the family has gotten kind of tense and torn apart a little bit. This is when Timmy goes to a box and grabs a family picture. And he also says, Turns out Santa didn't give me my Christmas wish after all. Then suddenly... I told you he's gonna blow them up. I told you. You didn't believe me, but I told you he was gonna do it. And now that there's a serious fire in their house, they need to find a way to escape. And luckily their chimney is rotting away. So the whole family grab random hard objects that are in the attic and they start breaking down the chimney and they escape by climbing out of the hole that the chimney left. They make it out of the house and they find that their house is ruined and the snow that was covering their house is gone. They start to get sad about everything they've lost in the house, but then Timmy chimes in with, We've got this. And I think the parents make up. I mean, they kiss right here, so I think they're back in love. Who knew almost dying would make you love your partner even more? And then Timmy says, This is the best Christmas ever. Best Christmas? <laughs> I don't want to see your worst Christmas. And then the episode ends there. Just kidding. Then a Hummer limo pulls up blasting some Christmas music. When Santa Claus himself stops and grabs the monster, drops Timmy's Christmas letter, and drives away. Santa Claus tried to murder this family. Jolly St. Nick. Yeah, it's, it's a tad bit out of character for you, Mr. Nick. But that is truly where the episode ends. The craziest plot twist ever. That's, that beats any Twilight Zone ending. Oh, you don't agree with me that it beats any... What if Santa Claus tried to murder you, huh? Yeah, you wouldn't like that, would you? No.
No, you wouldn't. On a serious note, this episode, it has a good message about, you know, family and divorce and Christmas, but it's also very weird and wacky. <laughs> like I did Creeped Out, you can check out that video right here. They did really good on the animatronic Santa and making him kind of creepy and scary, even with the face off. He was like a scary animatronic robot. This one had like a little, little creature gremlin groobly gobbly guy in it, which I guess is okay, but it doesn't really match Christmas at all, more of Halloween. And they never explained him either. He's just a monster that Santa unleashed on this family. They could have been like, this is a rotten elf. A rotten elf that teaches kids lessons when they've been naughty. There you go. Put me on the writing team. But let me know what you think about this episode of The Haunting Hour. Is it one of the goaded episodes or is it one of the worst? Check out any of my other Haunting Hour videos if you're still interested. Let me know what episodes you want to see me talk about in the comments below. Hit the like button if you feel like it. Thank you for watching the video. I appreciate you all and peace. Aww. He was in the shot for like five seconds. Hello everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is King Noosme. How about in this video we uh, make a deal? I promised I'm not a ghost. Wait, what are you looking at? So I ran a poll the other day and I asked you guys what episode of which show you want to see me talk about. And of course, The Haunting Hour wins. It wins every single time, every single time. But upon this poll, I had a few people that were kind of upset that I haven't done their favorite episode yet. And I just want to tell you guys, I decide which episodes I do based off a wheel with every episode recommendation on it. So it's literally just random. And whenever I do the episode, I take it off the wheel. If I haven't gotten to your favorite episode, I'm sorry. It's literally just luck. That being said, you guys voted for The Dead Body and The Dead Bodies. It's a two-parter, which is a very highly recommended episode. Some people say it's the best set of episodes in the series. Some people say they like the first one, but not the second one. Some people like the second one and not the first one. I think they're both really good. I think it tells like one good cohesive story, but it does have a pretty famous actor, Brendan Meyer, and he's in too much stuff to list, and I'm not going to try and list a bunch of movies because Lord knows I'll forget one of their favorite movies, and then I'll get a comment talking about why Freezer Burn, The Invasion of Laxdale, is your favorite movie and I didn't mention it and you're upset. Now people are going to be upset that I mentioned only that movie and not their favorite movie and I'm going to leave it that way. All right, let's get started. We start the first episode with the scariest place on earth. High school. And this is when we get to meet our main character, Will. Will is a bit awkward and shy and isn't very confrontational, but he's not like a nerd. He's just kind of a weird kid who immediately has a run in. Ah! with his bullies. Sorry, I was zoning out. Luckily, they let him off the hook pretty easy this time. And the next person we get to meet is Jake. And I know what you're thinking. King, why does he look like a greaser from the 60s? And to that I say, thank you for calling me a king. And two, I'm getting to it, give me a second. We'll see more of Jake later, but we cut back to Will and he's walking with his friend to the bus where his friend says the most cringeworthy thing I've heard in a long time. My question is, where are we gonna get our halo on? No one ever says that. Let's get our halo on. He might as well have been, wow, this new Rocket League game is so cool. I can't wait to get the AK-47 and destroy the Nexus. They couldn't get gamer lingo right in the early 2000s. But as his friend is talking, Will doesn't care. He's too busy being weird and staring at his crush. He wants to ask her to this dance that's going on at their school this Friday, but uh, he's a little nervous. On his way home from school, some weird things start happening to Will. At first, it's just small things like the fence blowing in the wind. Nothing too crazy. Then a trash can lid falls off of a trash can, which is a little more odd. Next is crazy huge cloud of smoke just blows through and almost blows him over. That one is a bit weird, I will say so myself. But he keeps walking down and then... Oh, thank God. It's just the dog... Oh, never mind. It was his bullies. They just wanted to pick on him, scare him a little bit, then run away like dorks. <laughs> And as Will is trying to regain his composure, we get to see a pair of Converse in front of him. And he looks up and this is when he meets Jake. Okay, pause. So this is the first time we get to hear the names of the bullies. And their names are... Travis and Chang. Excuse me, Travis and Chang? Yeah, Travis and Chang. Okay, I heard you right. So they're Travis and Chang, and someone said Travis's name earlier, so it's this guy. Well, that must mean that this guy's name is Chang. Does anybody see an issue with this? Jake asks Will why he continues to let the boys push him over, and Will feels like he can't do anything. He's kind of helpless in that situation. But Jake tells him, They won't leave you alone unless you make them. The next day at school, Will finally gains the courage to talk to Anna. And when he finally goes up to talk to her, he... Oh, God, Will, you scared me. Oh, maybe he can keep his cool around her. Is there something you want? No. God 
Damn it, Will. After he rambles to Anna for a little bit, Travis spills his water on Will. And this is when Will finally admits that, Just once, I wish I could get them back. And like clockwork, Jake suddenly shows up. Jake offers Will a favor for a favor. Jake will deal with the bullies for him if Will will give him a favor sometime in the future. Yeah. Yeah, we have a deal. The next day, the class go on a field trip, and Will actually does a pretty decent job at talking to Anna. Well, that is until Travis comes along, and Will does kind of a nice thing and tells him, hey, you're holding poison ivy. And for some reason, Travis just doesn't like this. So he pushes Will down, and Will lands Whoa, next Travis, to... Cut it out. Stop. A dead body. That hey, that's the name of the episode. Anna runs to get the teacher while Travis tries to make Will touch the dead body, and Will almost does it until... <laughs> Yes! It was Jake all along, and Will finally got his payback on the bullies. Well, Will is happy with the payback on the bullies, but Jake doesn't think it's enough. He thinks just one or two more scares, and then they'll be even. Will then asks Jake, why is he helping him so much? And Jake replies with, I don't like bullies. Then they both agree to kick it up a notch. This is when we cut to Travis, who is by himself lost in the woods. When he starts to hear whispers coming from what sounds like everywhere, and rocks are suddenly falling all around him. The wind starts blowing really hard, and then Travis discovers that he's not alone. We then cut back to Will and he's telling Anna about what him and Jake did. Jake? The new kid. She thinks it's kind of funny that he finally got payback on the bullies and then he pops the important question. Anna, the spring fling. I know it's no big deal, but would you go with me? Let's go, baby. He did it. Let's go. Give him a round of applause, everybody. Round of applause. After she says yes, because of course she says yes, look at this handsome devil right here. They hear Travis's screams echoing through the forest. And when they find him, he is cuddled up to a tree crying. The next day, Travis doesn't come to school and Anna wants to know what actually happened between them. Because according to Travis's mom, he's not coming back ever. And he tells Anna what he knows, which was the dead body prank that they pulled. And when he's explaining this, he says the name Jake Skinner. And this has the janitor's spidey senses tingling. He stops Will in the hall and says, Ain't no way you could have met Jake Skinner. Because Jake Skinner died in 1961. That's right. Jake looks like a greaser because he is a greaser. He died in 1961. And Will doesn't believe the janitor that he's dead until he finds a plaque in Jake's honor in the trophy case. And once again, Jake appears at the perfect time to freak Will out. Will asks Jake what he did to Travis and Jake answers, What you told me. Kicked it up a notch. <laughs> But now that Will knows what Jake really is, he tells him to stay away from him. But Jake likes pranking a little too much. But I'm having so much fun. Next, we get a scene of Chang working out in the gym alone, when balls and weights start falling off things and rolling past him. Scared, Chang grabs a football to protect himself, which is a dumb tactic, by the way. What if you miss? What are you going to do after you throw it? Is it like a distraction to punch him? Somebody else thinks this is a dumb tactic, too, because he starts hearing a laughter fill the room. And when he starts backing out of the room, he sees Jake standing in the hallway. And this is when we get one of the most cursed things I've ever seen come out of this show. <laughs> Will finds the janitor and asks him to tell him more about Jake Skinner. The janitor tells him that Jake was a strange dude and was kind of a loner. And because of this, some jocks started to pick on him. Well, Jake didn't take too kindly to the jocks, so he decided to pull a prank on them, which they did not enjoy either. So during their spring fling dance, they locked Jake in a cage and started throwing fireworks at him. And these fireworks caused the gym to burn down. Luckily, everybody made it out alive. Everybody except for Jake. And this is when Will starts hearing Chang's screams echo through the school. Will tries to find Jake in the gym, but he can't seem to find him. Maybe because he's a ghost. This is when Jake reminds Will that you still owe me a favor because I got your bullies to stop picking on you. This is when Will walks into the workout room and sees a picture of JFK, which is kind of strange because JFK is, uh, he's, um, not the president anymore. See what I did there? Because he got Suddenly, three boys bust through the door. It looks like it's Jake and the two jocks. They lock Jake in a storage closet room, and Will watches how Jake died. Well, almost died. Will is a good guy, so he saves Jake before he dies. When he breaks the lock to the cage and gets inside, Jake suddenly isn't in there anymore. Will sees Jake outside of the cage and asks him, are we even now? I saved your life. But Jake doesn't say anything. He just gives him a little wink. But this is when a fiery bookshelf falls on top of Will. But he wakes up a second later back in the present. How do I know we're back in the present? Because that picture of JFK is now Obama, which is the past for me, but the present for the show. Will runs to the gym and tries to explain to Anna everything that happened to him and why he's late to the dance, but she isn't even acknowledging his existence. This is when Jake introduces himself to Anna and basically steals Will's girl right in front of him. But that's not even the worst part because it is now revealed that so Will is a ghost. And now Jake is alive, forced to watch his crush dance with the man that killed him. And the episode ends with Jake saying, Now we're even. Oh 
Oh, what a crazy twist ending. I love a good plot twist like that. This is a really good episode. Just a standalone episode. If it ended right there, it would have been perfect. It would have matched every other ending to the haunting hour because every single one of them end with a kid just dying. But we're not done yet. Buckle up. We have a little bit more to talk about. And that episode was the fourth episode of season one. This next one we're talking about is in season three, towards the end of season three too. So it's been a whole season. They've had a whole season to amp up their game. We start the episode the night we left off and Jake unnecessarily breaks the trophy glass to get his plaque out of there. You could have just like asked for a key or something. Then we skip three months later and it is revealed that Anna and Jake are now dating. And the SATs are coming up for her, which is really important because she wants to get into college. As she's grabbing things out of her locker, Will comes up to her and starts talking to her about random things. But if you remember what happened probably two seconds ago, you remember Will is dead. Wait, how did he get a haircut if he's dead? And she can't hear him at all. Or at least we thought she couldn't hear him until- Anna! Cut to Jake outside waiting for Anna to get out of school when he does the cool greaser hair comb thing. You look like an idiot standing here combing your hair like that. <laughs> yeah, that's so stupid. I didn't think that was cool. <laughs> Jake kind of rubs it in that he's alive and Will is dead now. You have no idea how good it feels to be alive. Oh. And then complains about everything that is wrong with the world now that he's alive. He's extinct. Gas is ridiculously expensive. Oh, and what the heck is a blog? And also in this scene, we get to see that Will is starting to slowly fade away. Jake asks Anna out for the night, but she says no, she has to study for the SATs. And he tells her, You have the rest of your life to take tests. But she insists that the SATs are very important and you can't just, you know, skip over these. And he doesn't like that she's turning him down. He's just being a big crybaby over it. It's one night. You'll survive one night without your girlfriend, I promise. Inside Anna's house, she grabs a book to start studying for the SATs. And when she sets it on the desk, she accidentally knocks over a yearbook that opens up to a page of a missing poster of Will. What happened to you, Will? This is when Will tells Anna everything that happened, but he's a ghost so she can't hear him. Everything he says is just a recap of the last episode. So if you're really interested, you could just rewind the video and then rewatch it and oh my god you got the recap and this is when he says he'll end up using you before disappearing out of the room we then cut to jake's home which is a mechanic shop and will confronts jake about being a psycho he says that anna's gonna find out everything that happened to him soon and she's gonna want to leave you anyways but jake knows anna's not gonna find out anytime soon and then he rubs it in again that he's alive and will is dead this is so good you want a bite oh that was mean will and jake then argue about if their favors were even even, which they weren't, by the way, I want to point that out. Two pranks equal a whole life of human being. No, that's not how that works. But Jake thinks that he's living a better life than Will, so he deserves life more than him. This is when we see Will starting to fade away again, and Jake tells him to just go towards the light. It's where you belong. And this pisses Will off, so he lunges at him, but he disappears before he can do anything. Suddenly, every car and tool in the shop start going crazy, but Jake isn't scared because he thinks it's Will. He's surprised that Will has a good poltergeist skills, though. You know, you had those, uh, Poltergeist skills. That is until Jake starts seeing a black cloak dash across the room, revealing that it wasn't Will after all. Yes, death is here to take Jake with him, but he can't take Jake if Jake is alive, so he grabs his arm, and everyone knows what happens if death touches you. You die. That, that's the whole point. Now that Jake is literally decomposing, Will starts poking fun at him because he kind of deserves it. Looks like you got yourself a problem, Jake. Maybe I won't get my life back, but something tells me you're not keeping yours. This is when Jake pulls up to Anna's house and asks her to take a break from studying to have a little ride with him. And Will tries to warn Anna, but of course she can't hear him, so she gets in the car anyways. Jake takes her to this clifftop that's overlooking their city. As they're standing very close to the edge, he starts talking about how fragile life is, how one step could easily just end your life. He then starts telling her about how much he cares for her and how he would die for her and how he can't see her in pain. And this is when she lets him know that I'm not suffering, I'm very happy right now. And he replies with, yeah, right now. But we never know what's gonna happen. And this comment makes her think about Will and about how he just disappeared one day with no trace. And Jake gets uber pissed off that she's thinking about another guy, even more so Will. He gets so angry, in fact, that he starts decomposing faster. Jake tries to make a deal with Anna, her life for his. And then he tries to shake her hand, but she smacks it out of the way. He then gaslights her into thinking that she wants him to die. You don't care about me at all. You never did. That's not true. You would like for me to die, wouldn't you? No, you want for me to suffer? Bro is a... A1 gaslighter. He has done this before. He made that shit look easy. But before she could shake his hand, Will says, Anna, don't! And like an idiot, Jake yells at Will. Shut up, Will! Will! 
and somehow another person acknowledging Will makes him come live again and he stops Anna from shaking his hand. And just like all of us, Jake is confused. Oh. Will found his way back because he found a reason to stay. And his reason is to protect Anna, so that's what he's gonna do. <laughs> well, that lasted long. Jake pins Anna down and tries to force a handshake out of her, when suddenly Will kicks Jake off of her. They have a literal fist fight scene, which is really cool and a lot better than most Marvel movies today. But Jake comes out on top. <laughs> Ow, oh, that one had to hurt. But when Jake gets up, we see that he has a uh, special visit from someone very, very special. And after we watch Jake literally decompose in front of us, we get to see a rainbow-like spirit come for Will. So it doesn't look like Will can stay. But it's okay with him because now Anna is safe. And he starts walking towards the light and then the light slowly disappears. So I guess he can stay? And Will can't believe it either. I get to keep on living. Anna starts asking Will questions like, what happened? Why am I here? What's going on? But like a good friend, Will knows that she has to take the SATs tomorrow and she needs to study. I don't know how you're going to study after all of this. That's, I, I wouldn't be able to think of anything else for the next two months. So her and Will get into a car and Will tells her everything on the way home. Then they allude to a third episode that sadly never happened. That or Jake just really wanted his comb in the afterlife. <laughs> And that's the end of Dead Body slash Bodies. Great set of episodes, great two-parter. It's almost like you can watch one or the other, that you don't have to watch both of them, so that's even better. But it is one of the best episodes of The Hunting Hour. I see why you guys like these episodes so much. The acting in this was actually pretty good compared, there were some times when I was like, a little cringe, but other than that, it was pretty top tier acting. There's no like really cringy scenes, kind of like Creature was starring. Go watch that video if you haven't seen it yet. All the acting in that whole episode was so bad. I hated it and loved it. Let me know what you think about dead bodies in the comments below. Also, let me know any other haunting hour episodes you want to see me talk about or Goosebumps episodes or any other TV series you want to see me talk about. Like the video if you like the video. Thank you for watching the video. I appreciate you all and peace. It's that time of the week again where I crawl out of the hole in your wall and make you some juicy content. Last week I ran a poll asking you guys what episode of The Hunting Hour you guys want to see me talk about and you guys voted for the episode Walls, which has been highly recommended to me for a little while now. It's also kind of controversial in a way. Some people think it's like super terrifying that the monster and the walls, it gave them fears of people and things in their walls. Some people think it's the dumbest episode of The Hunting Hour. I think it's pretty funny. It made me laugh a lot. We start the episode by meeting our main character, Jeffrey, who's played by Bobby Coleman, who actually plays another character in another episode of The Haunting Hour called Swarman Norman, and he plays as the main character Norman in that one too. Let me know if you want to see that one in the comments below. Jeffrey and his family are actually moving into a new house. Well, new to them, it looks like it's uh, seen some better days. Kind of looks like Monster House a little bit, doesn't it? Right? Can you see it? No? Okay. Jeffrey thinks his house looks creepy and he doesn't like it. He asks his parents, Why couldn't we have gotten a normal looking house? But his mom and dad seem to think that there's a little bit of charm to their house. And you'll know what they mean by that if you stick around to the end. They make it inside and Jeffrey's dad shows him his new room, which is a baby nursery with weird wallpaper that have sheep on it that are kind of creepy too. So obviously Jeffrey's excited about his new room. After pouting for a little bit more, Jeffrey's dad tells him to go hang out with some of the neighborhood kids, get to know the kids around, make some new friends. But whenever he walks up to them, they just run away. Well, all but one kid named Chuck. Chuck tells Jeffrey that the reason they ran away is because he's moving into that house and that house is creepy. Apparently an old man died in that house. That's it. That's, that's pretty much the reason why it's creepy. Then Chuck leaves, but before he says bye, he says this. Been nice knowing you. Next, we learn that they're moving into this house because Jeffrey's dad actually got a new job with a huge raise. But Jeffrey doesn't care about his dad's job. He misses his old house and wants to move back. Brother, you've been there for less than eight hours. Just give the house a chance. His parents ask him to at least try and like it first before you decide you dislike it. And he does agree, but he's not very happy about it. Later that night, Jeffrey's asleep when he starts hearing knocking sounds coming from his walls. And then it sounds like something falls underneath his bed. And when he looks down there, he sees something that totally freaks him out, but we don't get to see it. He runs screaming to his mom and dad and asks them to go into his bedroom and check under his bed. His dad drags himself out of bed and goes to check and gets eaten by a monster. Gotcha. Just kidding, he had to pull a little dad joke. So Jeffrey goes back to bed. I wouldn't be dangling my arm right there if I thought there was a monster under my bed. But since he was scared, he decided to plug in a nightlight to make himself feel a little bit safer. But somebody doesn't like the light. This is when a yellowish monster that looks both moist and dry at the same time, I don't know if he needs moisturizer or lotion, comes out wearing bear slippers or cat slippers. Maybe ducks? What is this animal? Anyways, he takes Jeffrey's nightlight and says, Too bright. 
The next morning, Jeffrey goes downstairs to see his mom made pancakes, and his dad mentions putting a sauna in their house. How can you afford a sauna but live in a house that looks like this? <laughs> Anyways, Jeffrey asks his mom where's the syrup, but when he checks, it's not there. But when his mom checks, she uses that magic spell all moms have when a child is looking for something and they can't find it, they can just get it teleported to them as long as they're looking like they're trying to find it as well. Don't think I don't know what's going on. So yeah, she finds the syrup there. We also learn that Jeffrey's mom is a clothes designer and her clothes are getting picked up by a big clothing line, which is great. That means their family is making even more money. And his dad's also getting a company car. A Range Rover. A what now? What, did, what does your dad work for? Elon Musk? Jeffrey asks his mom and dad about the previous owner of the house. And this is when the, his parents start acting a bit strange and try to swerve the question. He says the kids say that an old man lived here and he died in here, but the dad just blows it off and tells him that the kids were just trying to pick on him because he's new. And his mom distracts him by asking him what kind of cake he wants. Chocolate peanut butter, of course. Later, Jeffrey is opening boxes outside for some reason. When Chuck walks up and asks him about a sugar cave, apparently the old man that lived there before would buy bags and bags of sugar and tell him that he was feeding the walls for the creature in the sugar cave and that if he didn't, then terrible things would happen to him. And after he started feeding him, a week later, the old man died. They found him completely naked, face down in a pile of sugar. Are you sure that was sugar, my guy? Cocaine's a hell of a drug. Back inside, Jeffrey is playing with some toys when he starts hearing the knocking in the walls again. And as he's investigating the knocking, we see that something is watching him through little holes in the walls. When he tells his dad about the knocking, his dad blows it off and tells him that maybe it's just the house settling because old houses do that. After that, Jeffrey's mom finds the cake that she baked for them all gone and the plate that she put it on in Jeffrey's closet. I didn't do anything. And Jeffrey starts noticing that whatever he tells his parents, they just don't believe him and they're starting to treat him like an outsider. They don't believe him about the knocking on the walls, they don't believe him that there was a monster under his bed, and they don't believe him about the cake. So this is when he starts to pitch a little bit of a fit and goes all in about how nasty and disgusting this house is. I hate it here! So angry at his parents, he storms back into his room where he hears the knocking once again. Then he notices something strange about one of the sheep on the wall. When he gets a closer look at it, he sees that the eye of the sheep is carved out, and not only that, but... Something is watching him through it. Jeffrey takes a closer look into the hole and he sees that a few of his toys are inside. This is when he gets a knife and cuts a bigger hole in the wall to get his stuff. But when he reaches for it, the creature grabs him and says, if you tell anyone about me, I'll take your parents. So he promises the creature that he's not going to tell anybody about. It. Then Jeffrey's parents come in to check on him, but they're pretty much just trying to gaslight him into liking the house. This house is Wow, that worked. Well, it was probably more of the monster hiding behind him than his parents trying to gaslight him. And the next morning, Jeffrey's mom makes waffles, and once again, he asks for the syrup. And when he opens the cabinet, more syrup. the monster seems to want some too. So Jeffrey quickly comes up with an excuse to run to the store by himself, and on his way back home, he actually runs into Chuck, who's in his garage painting Warhammer figurines, which is pretty cool, honestly. Jeffrey lied to the monster and he tells Chuck that there is, in fact, a monster in his wall. And Chuck wants to help him kill the monster, so they decide to replace the syrup in one of the bottles with kerosene, which if you didn't know is a little poisonous and dangerous and will kill you. Jeffrey gets inside and hands the monster the poison syrup while his dad talks to him about moving anxiety and why he thinks his son has it. This is when his dad opens the cabinet to get something, but... <laughs> The monster found out it was not syrup. Also, his dad blames him for the mess that was just made, even though technically he was the one that opened the cabinet and let it fall. So technically it was the dad's fault. But right after that, dad leaves to go get some cleaning supplies when the monster tells him more syrup. Jeffrey goes back to Chuck's house and they devise a new plan. He's still at his Warhammer station, but he just casually opens up a drawer that has two encyclopedias full of monsters and demons that he just has on standby for no reason. What the fuck? So the boys spend the rest of the day looking for the monster in the books in hopes that the book will give them a way to kill it, which they do. Ever heard of a Clement? The name of the monster is a Clement. Clements are wall dwellers that like sweet food and have a bit of a temper. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. This is when Chuck remembers that they have bug killer in their house from an infestation they had. They're totally lethal. This is when the boys go back to Jeffrey's house to try to find the entrance to the sugar cave. This is when Jeffrey tells him that he hears a lot of noises coming out of his closet, so maybe it's in there, and he is correct. And they do find the lever, and it opens in a James Bond kind of way. So Jeffrey puts his big boy pants on, gets the syrup and the bug bomb, and goes inside the hole. And while he's in there, it's very creepy and dark. There's very little light. And there are old pictures of random people on the wall and all kinds of little kids' toys everywhere. Also, just loads of insulation, which has to be itchy. I figured it out. His skin's dry from all the fiberglass that's stuck inside of his skin and probably in his bloodstream by now. Here, bud, got some lotion here for you. Don't ask me why I have lotion on my desk.
Don't ask me why. Jeffrey looks around for a while, but he doesn't seem to find the Clement anywhere. But the Clement knows exactly where he is. He pounces on Jeffrey and asks him, What are you doing in my walls? Jeffrey tells him that he wanted to hand deliver the syrup for him earlier since he didn't like the one before, so he just wanted to be nice. This is when bro chugs the syrup. This is the most watery syrup I've ever seen in my life. But before he kills the Clement, he tries to befriend it. It must get lonely in here. Maybe we could be friends. But gets turned down pretty quickly. This is when Jeffrey just blasts him with the bug ball and runs away. And he almost makes it, but the Clement gets a hold of his legs. With all the commotion and screaming, Jeffrey's parents actually come in to save the Clement. He looks just as confused as me. This is when Jeffrey gets in trouble for upsetting the Clement. I mean, the parents literally coddle this monster and feed him syrup like a baby. This is when his mom says, Do you realize how long it took us to find a house with a Clement? What? Apparently, Clements bring good fortune to the people that live in the house, and that's why they took so long to find this house, and also why they moved into this nasty looking house. <laughs> It's also why his parents have had such good luck this whole episode and why they're making so much money. And Jeffrey tells him about the Clement that threatened to hurt his parents and then also killed the last guy. That old man was 114 years old. He had a 29 year old girlfriend. <laughs> he said what? Oh God, that's everywhere. That's gotta be the wildest thing I've ever heard come out of a kid's show. Jeffrey tells his parents about all the shit he's been through to try to take care of this Clement because he thought that if he didn't take care of it, he's gonna kill his parents and they make him feel crazy because he thinks there's something in the walls, but they don't believe him. But his mom says, Just think how difficult this has been for us, honey. Apparently the more people that know about the Clement, the less fortune it has. But it doesn't matter if your son already knows about the Clement because it's in the walls. Whenever he said, Hey, there's knocking in the walls. Why didn't you say, okay, we have something to tell you. Since you're gonna live here, there's a monster in the walls we have to take care of. It's that simple. But they tell him that since he lives in this house, he should be getting good fortune too. But so far, only bad things have happened to Jeffrey. So he asks them, So what do I get? But his parents don't respond to him. This is when Jeffrey decides he's gonna tell as many people as he can about the Clement so it has no fortune at all. Then his parents tell him, you can get whatever you want. So he chooses to move into the master bedroom, have as many any sodas and sweets as he wants and have a boys night with Chuck. And because he gets the master bedroom and all the good things, he banishes his parents to his nursery room where the Clement bothers them all night. Sarah. I need Sarah. So his parents have to share his tiny bed and take care of the thing that knocks in the walls. And the episode ends with the Clement chugging some syrup. A pretty funny episode. I thought it was funny. It didn't really scare me. I just thought it was pretty goofy and wacky. I think the, the design of the Clement is really cool. It's, uh, it's creepy enough to where it gave me the heebie-jeebies. But like, it's also kind of funny. It's not too scary. It's not like the fucking dream catcher. That actually scared the shit out of me. Also, his parents are horrible. What the fuck? Usually like in the kid shows, the kids are like the brats and they, they get their lesson. But in this one, they flipped it on its head. The parents learn a lesson. Let me know what you think about the episode of Walls in the comments below. Tell me any other Haunting Hour episodes you want to see me talk about or any other show you want to see me talk about. Check out this video right here. It's my first Goosebumps video. Like the video if you like the video. Thank you for watching the video. I appreciate you all and peace. I don't know what to do for a cool intro. You like jazz? Hello everybody, my name is King Noosme. I know in my last video I said that my next video was going to be Night of the Living Dummy. I lied, I am still working on that video. <laughs> I want it to be a good video. I, I'm sorry I want to make good videos for you guys, okay? I'm sorry I want to be- I'm sorry I want to be good for you guys, okay? But I did get a comment on my last video that was like, I thought you were the Haunting Hour guy. You haven't made a Haunting Hour video in four weeks. <laughs> You're right, what kind of Haunting Hour guy am I if I haven't made a Haunting Hour video in four weeks? And I also have a fan that comments on pretty much everything I do named Andre who asks for my robot every single time. Sometimes Sometimes more demanding than others. I okay, I, I'll, I'll do it for you, Andre. I'll do it for you. And with that being said, I do want to say something else. I'm gonna get a little bit serious here for a second. I am one person. I work on these videos, I script these videos, I edit these videos. I sit down and watch the episode or episodes multiple times to think of jokes and things to say. I know you guys would like to see your favorite episode of whatever show, but I physically cannot do more than one video a week. I can maybe do two if I work very hard and quickly. I'll get to your favorite episode one day. Just please be patient with me. I'm trying my best. <laughs> we start the episode by meeting one of the main characters, Philip. And Philip is participating in a science experiment at school about electricity. So Philip has his hand on this metal ball that sends static electricity through his body and makes his hair stand up. Kind of looks like Lewis from Meet the Robinsons. Like that's not even like a roast or a joke. Like he just looks like him. If there was like a live action Meet the Robinsons, they should make this guy play Lewis. The teacher asked the class a question, but uh, nobody wants to give it a shot. Well, no one 
one but one person, Boyd, and that's Philip's bully. What this demonstrates is that Philip can look even more like a dweeb than usual. Ain't no way you're calling Philip a dweeb when you got that Ludwig ass haircut. But luckily, Boyd gets his karma. I love the hair. See, if you'd pay attention in class, you'd know how electricity works, and you'd know that if you touched him, you would have gotten shocked. And in class, Boyd got a little bit embarrassed, so after class, obviously, he blames Philip for him getting embarrassed. And we beat our other main character, Tim. See, Tim is a nice guy. He comes up to the bullies and tells them to stop picking on Philip. He didn't do anything wrong. But, of course, they don't. I had a punch your nerd face. And Philip warns them to not hit him. You gonna do something about it? I won't. But my robot will. Yeah, he, he does sound a little crazy when he says that. Apparently, his robot is super protective and will kill anybody that messes with him. And the bullies don't believe him. Quit lying. Tim tries to help Philip by telling the bullies uh, he's just joking about the robot stuff. Right? No, he's totally real. Philip claims that he bought this robot off the internet and he had to put it together himself. Tim tries to talk to Philip and tell him that nobody's gonna believe you about the robot. Luckily, a teacher comes around and makes the bullies leave him alone. And Tim interrupts him and says, just lay low. The bullies will stop messing with you if you just keep a low profile. And later that day, Tim gets a weird message thanking him for helping Philip from Philip's robot. And the next day at school, Tim confronts Philip for pranking him by sending him a fake email thanking him from his robot. But Philip doesn't know what he's talking about and gets a little freaked out about what's going on. Philip takes Tim outside and demands that he tell him what the email said exactly. And then followed that by saying, he contacts you again, don't answer. Then they hear a weird noise. Kind of sounds like an elephant farting. Tell me that's not an elephant farting. Philip grabs Tim and they run and go hide in the janitor's closet. Why do all these kids hide in the janitor's closet? I feel like that'd be like the first place I'd look for kids hiding. Philip tells him that that sound is very similar to the sound his robot makes when he's walking. And the robot might be secretly watching them to make sure that they're not getting hurt. And that's when the robot walks up to the door and... Oh, never mind, it was the janitor. Now Tim is pissed at Philip for lying about having some freaky robot and then angrily walks back to class. Little do they know, somebody saw the whole thing. And later that day, Philip apologizes to Tim about lying about the robot and then awkwardly walks home. Okay, I'm gonna say it, I can't take it anymore. The kid looks like Spongebob. Tell me he doesn't look like Spongebob. Look at him. You can't tell me that small boy isn't Spongebob. That felt good. That felt good to get off my chest. Anyways, Tim follows Philip home and peeks in his window to see that Philip does in fact have a robot. Oh, well, m maybe he doesn't. Never mind. No, he definitely has a robot. Luckily, Philip saves Tim from certain death for now. Tim decides to hang around for a little bit and chill out with the robot. And Philip warns him to not get too close. The robot really doesn't like people in its personal space. So obviously Tim tries to touch the robot. I told you. Good lord, that dude's quick. That robot's gonna get whiplash. Then the robot kindly demonstrates to Tim what will happen if Tim tries to touch him once again. And something tells me that he's not too fond of Tim. We learn that the robot makes Philip a smoothie every day because he's read that this certain smoothie is really healthy for people. What's in that smoothie anyways? Kelp and liver. Ew, what the fuck? <laughs> it's not that serious, bro. It's not that serious, damn. It's not that serious. It's a smoothie. It's just a smoothie. You don't have to kill me. It's just a smoothie. Once again, Philip saves Tim from total annihilation and drinks the disgusting smoothie. To be fair, the robot does just want Philip to be healthy and safe, which is cool but he just does it in a really intense way. And the smoothie isn't even the worst part of the routine. It's, it's time for my daily aerobic exercises. And then I have to study for exactly three hours. The robot's like one of those parents on the world's strictest parents. If you ever like want to feel better about your parents, go watch an episode of that show. That show fucking sucks. <laughs> I do not want to be one of those kids. Then Tim pretty much gets kicked out of the house. The next day at school, Philip tells Tim a little bit more of the rules. He has to eat this wonderful meal for lunch every day. He's not allowed to have junk food. He's not allowed to watch TV unless it's educational. And he's not allowed to ride a bike because they're too dangerous. And apparently when he first got the robot, it was very helpful. It did his chores and his homework and other things. But since it uses AI to learn, it started to learn things from the internet. And then it started to read things. And then 
it discovered that in the long run, to help Philip, it needs to make Philip do his own things. And Tim gives Philip a pretty simple solution to this. Just say no. But just hearing that phrase makes Philip nervous enough to where he has to just get up and leave. And apparently the last people that told the robot no were his parents. The robot thought the parents were bad influences, so, so it, it did, did what, what it, it had, had to, to do to them. them. Just kidding, they're just scared of it and refuse to come home, so they just abandoned their child with this evil robot. Good parents. The boys try to come up with a plan to possibly reset or shut down the robot. We learn that the power switch is underneath the buttons on the front of him, but the robot won't let them get close enough to press the button. And they can't just sneakily go up to the robot because, well the robot won't let them get close. So how are they going to somehow shut down this robot? Tim offers a pretty smart plan. What if they just shock the robot? Which is very smart because computers are super sensitive. Even a little bit of static electricity is anywhere on your body when you're building a PC, you can fry the whole thing. It's awesome and not terrifying when you're trying to build your PC. Like so intense that people buy bands just so they don't do that. It's crazy. So they make up a plan where they can somehow shock the robot, but they need somebody that's a little stupid to join in with them. But who's dumb enough to join them in this plan? Cut to the robot waiting for Philip to come home. And it looks like Philip is running late. Needless to say, robot goes out to find him. And back at the school, we learn that the bullies do agree to join in with the plan as long as Philip does their homework for a week. And Tim wonders if the robot would even show up and how it would know where Philip is. And Philip just assures Tim that he will show up and he does in fact know where I am. And he was not kidding either. Tim goes into the hallway to find the robot is in fact in the school and the boys go on with the plan. The bullies and Philip stand outside the science room door and they pretend to beat up Philip while he just calmly yells, help, help, please help. And the robot almost instantly finds him as fast as he can with this walking speed. And when the bullies see him, they think the robot is so cool that they completely just drop the plan to go fuck with the robot. And this is when Boyd makes the stupid decision of touching him. and he promptly gets his head ripped off and thrown across the school. Okay, that was a lie. They just, they just shock him a little bit and then they run away. But now the other boys are pissed because the bullies ruined their plan to reset the robot and they still have to find a way to get the robot shocked. Also, you can see the actor in the robot suit in this scene. You can see his face through the little mesh that they put on the visor. It's very funny. I think it's very goofy. As it's going to help Philip, the robot scans the room for information and it learns pretty quickly, honestly, that it's in danger and then slowly backs away. Luckily, Tim had a backup plan. They just put the robot on a dolly and push him all the way. Well, that didn't work. The robot grabs onto Tim, and I guess to try and hurt him, but the boys use what they learned earlier in the episode to grab onto each other to shock the robot. Which actually shuts him down. Oh, no. Oh, okay, good. It's just a factory reset. Like a nice, respectable person, Tim introduces himself to the robot first. Yes! which was a big mistake. Now that Tim told the robot his name, Tim is now responsible for the robot. And Philip was hoping this would happen. So now Philip lost one of his only friends, but he doesn't care because now he can go home, watch TV, eat junk food, and see his parents. We also learned in this moment that the bow tie he's been wearing this whole episode was actually a tracking device so the robot could find him. And now Tim has to find a way to get rid of this robot. And that's the end of the episode. It's a pretty good episode. It has like a nice twist at the end. I didn't expect it, that's for sure. And if if you rewatch the episode knowing this information now, you can kind of tell that Philip is manipulating Tim a little bit. He just does a few things that kind of doesn't make sense, and he really pushes the agenda that he has a robot. He does not shut up about it the whole time. And speaking about the robot, it looks like a SpongeBob villain. You know, like, you know, they put like green screen SpongeBob shit. It looks like one of those. Like, how do you have something like the Dreamcatcher or like even Big Yellow in Mascot, you, Lily D? They have all these really cool costume designs this whole time, and then they have. HVAC unit on legs. Like, what is that? Other than that, it's a pretty fun episode, honestly. It's not very scary, in my opinion. It's more of just to sit back, have fun, watch a little silly tale kind of thing. I personally don't think robots and AI is scary, but some people might. Let me know what you think about the episode in the comments below. Also, I have a Patreon. The link will be down in the description, so please go join that if you want to support me. Still not sure what I'm going to use it for yet. Maybe I'll post videos a day early there for our my little patrons, so... I don't know, it might be worthwhile. That is all I have for you today. Like the video if you liked the video. Thank you for watching the video all the way through. I appreciate you all and...
Peace.